Welcome to Lesson 17, which roughly covers pages 104 to 112 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to cover the dictionary data type. Like a list, a dictionary is a collection of many values. But unlike list indexes, indexes for dictionaries can use many different data types, not just integers. Indexes for dictionaries are called keys, and a key with its associated value is called a key value pair. Let's type in a small dictionary and save it to the mycat variable. So in code, a dictionary is typed with curly braces. Inside the braces are the key value pairs. So I'll have a string value for a key, then have a colon, and its value will be the string value fat. And you can have multiple key value pairs by separating them with commas. So I'll have another key and its value and another key and its value. This dictionary's keys are the strings size, color, and disposition. The values are fat, gray, and loud. And this will just be a dictionary value that describes my cat, so I store it in a variable named my cat. You can access these values through their keys just like a list. So square bracket, and then I'll type the key, and this evaluates to that key's value in the dictionary. So you can use this in any expression, like I'll just have some string concatenation here to create this string, my cat has gray fur. And dictionaries can still use integer values as keys, just like lists use integers for indexes, but they don't have to start at zero, and they can be any number. So I can have a dictionary like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for the key, and its value will be the string luggage combination. And then maybe another key 42 for the value, the answer. Now, unlike lists, items in dictionaries are unordered. The first item in a list named spam would be spam0. But there's no quote-unquote first item in a dictionary. While the order of items matters for determining whether two lists are the same, such as comparing the list 1, 2, 3 with list 3, 2, 1. Oh, whoops. You can see these are false. Even though they have the same content, the order matters for lists. But for dictionaries, that's not the case. I could have something like x equals the dictionary name Zofi species cat age 8 and then have a different dictionary stored in the ham variable that has the exact same key value pairs except in a different order And Python will consider these to be the exact same dictionary. So dictionaries have no order. Dictionary might be a poor name for this data type because it's not like the keys are in alphabetical order like the words in a real dictionary, but you can think of the key value pair being like the word and definition pairs in a real dictionary. If you know the word, you can get the definition. If you know the key, you can get the value. Trying to access a key that doesn't exist in a dictionary will result in a key error error message, much like a lists out of range index error message. So if I tried something like eggs color, there is no color key in the eggs dictionary, so I get a key error. And you can check if a key exists in a dictionary value with the in and not in operators. So I can try to check if the name key or the name string value exists as a key in the dictionary in eggs. And it does. We have that right here. Or if I try the not in operator, I'll get false because it's false that name is not in the dictionary in eggs. Keep in mind that dictionaries are mutable, like lists. Variables hold references to dictionary values. Variables don't actually hold the dictionary value itself. And there are three dictionary methods that will return list-like values of the dictionary's keys, values, or both keys and values. 
and these are the keys method. Oop. The values method and the items method, which actually returns a list of two item tuples of the key for the first item and the value as the second item. Now these methods actually return list-like data types. You can see actually the keys method returns a dict keys. So if you want an actual list value of the keys, you have to pass that value to the list function and that'll return a list value. But you can use these methods in for loops like if I say for k in eggs.keys, print k, then I can print them all out. Here I can use each key in the eggs dictionary inside this for loop. And the same for all the values as well. You know, I have whatever code that uses the v variable that stores all the values. And I can use the multiple assignment trick and have multiple variables in the for loop for the items. So remember how items is actually returns two item tuples. The first item is the key and the second item is the value. And I can just store those in the k and v variables right here and then print them out. Otherwise I would have the tuple values themselves assigned to the single variable and it would print out these tuples. Just in case you missed it, uh, tuples are basically the exact same thing as lists, except they're immutable and they use parentheses instead of the square brackets. You can also use the in and not in operators to see whether a certain key or value exists in a dictionary. So we have this dictionary stored in eggs, and one of the values is the string cat. So I can check for that by saying cat in eggs.values. And that'll return true because the cat key, the cat value does exist inside this dictionary as one of the keys' values. Now it's really tedious to check whether a key exists in a dictionary before accessing the key's value. You want to avoid that key error error message. You know, if I say, oh, does the color key exist? No, and then this error will crash my program. So I'd have to have something like if color in eggs, then do something with the uh, color key for that dictionary. And if this doesn't exist, then nothing is done, and that prevents the error message from happening, but it's really tedious to have this if statement every time. So Python gives us a get method that takes two arguments. And the first argument is the key of the value to retrieve, just like we have it color right here is the key that we wanted to retrieve. And then the second argument to the get method is a fallback default value that the method returns if that key doesn't exist in the dictionary. So let's take a look at the eggs dictionary right now. We can see we have the keys name, species, and age. And let's just call the get method and say, oh, we want to return the, key, the value for key age. And if it doesn't exist, return zero. But you can see it returns eight because the key, because the dictionary does have the key age. However, we could say uh, get the color keys value, and if do that doesn't exist, then just return the blank string. And you can see since the color key doesn't exist inside this dictionary, it will go ahead and default to this second argument that we passed, so it returns a blank string. This is really handy if you have some dictionary that's keeping track of, say, how many things you're bringing to a picnic. And then you have some code that says, I am bringing uh, however many numbers of things. But if you're not bringing anything, you want to return a default value. So in this case, returning the integer zero to the picnic. And I'm going to have to first convert this into a string in order to do string concatenation on it. 
So you can see because napkins doesn't exist inside this dictionary, we just return the default value. So it says I am bringing zero to the picnic. I guess I could say bringing zero napkins to the picnic. So if we didn't have the get method, we just tried to do this with the normal square bracket syntax. Anytime we try that on a key that doesn't exist, we would end up with a key error error message. The opposite of the get method is the set default method. You'll often have to set a value in a dictionary for a certain key only if that key doesn't already have a value. The code looks something like this. I have my eggs dictionary, and it has the key's name, species, age. If color not in eggs, eggs color equals black. So this will set the color key to the string value black, but only if it doesn't already have some setting in the eggs dictionary. And the set default method offers a way to do this in one line of code. I'll just reset the eggs dictionary. And instead, we can just call the set default method. Say, I want to set the color key only if it's not already set so that it defaults to black. So now you can see there's a key value pair color and the value is the string black. Now, if we try to set this to something different, say, set this to orange, this actually doesn't change anything because the color key already exists. It has the setting black right here. So calling set default doesn't do anything. It doesn't change it to orange. The set default method is a nice shortcut to ensure that a key exists. So let's create a short program that counts the number of occurrences of a letter in a string. Go ahead and open the file editor by clicking File, New File. And I'm going to save this as character count dot py. So we'll have a variable called message and this will keep the string that we want to have the letters counted. So how about It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. We'll just have a dictionary that contains key value pairs of where the keys are each letter and the value is how many a times it appears in this message variable. So we might have a key value pair like R is the key and then the value is 12 if the letter R appears in this string 12 times. So we'll just loop through each character in the message variable. Remember, a string is a list-like value, so we can use it in a for loop. And on each iteration of loop, the character variable here will be assigned a single letter from this variable message. But remember, the count dictionary starts off completely empty. It doesn't have any keys in it, but we want to make sure that it starts off at zero before we start counting that particular letter. So we'll call the set default method and say, okay, for whatever letter you have, start it off with a value of zero. So on the first iteration, when this capital I is assigned to character, we call count.setDefault and it says, hey, if you don't have the letter I, as a key, go ahead and create that key value pair and make the value zero. And that ensures that there's no error on this next line when we have, let's update the count for that character to be equal to its current value plus one. And that's the entire, that's the entire for loop. Now at the very end of the program, we'll just print out count. So I'm gonna save that and then run it. And you can see, this program has quickly gone through the entire string and just counted up all the letters for us. So the lowercase w appears two times, the uppercase i appears once. Now this program isn't completely ideal because we have lowercase a's counted separately from uppercase a's. So let's just change this slightly. Instead of going through the string in message, let's call message is upper method and then go through that string. So it's basically going through an uppercase version of this string. I'll save that, press F5 to run, and now we can see, ah, okay, so there are five A's because all of the lowercase A's have been converted to uppercase. 
Now, if we didn't have this set default method, I'll just comment that out and then save it and then run it, we would get an error message because the first time that we try to increment a count that doesn't exist, the, the key that doesn't exist, then we're going to get that key error. Now this program will work no matter what string is inside the message variable, even if that string is thousands or millions of characters long. In fact, let's try that out. I'm going to go to the automatetheboringstuff.com slash files slash rj.txt, and this is a text file of the entire text of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And I'll just hit Control A to select all and Control C to hit copy. I'll go back to my program and I'll change this. Now there's unescaped quotes inside this Romeo and Juliet text, so I'm going to have to use a special trick of the triple quotes, which is Python's multi-line string that you'll learn about in a couple lessons from now. But basically the triple quotes allow you to escape everything automatically and have the string go across multiple lines. And then I'll just end that with another triple quote. So this is one giant, one giant string that's being assigned to message. And then the rest of the program is just the same as before. Press F5 to run this. And you can see instantly Python has gone through this giant string and counted up all of this. We can see that in this particular text, there's 11,051 letter T's in the entire Romeo and Juliet text. Now this output is kind of messy. This is just printing out the dictionary value itself. If we actually wanted the letter A, it's going to be buried somewhere in the middle here and not at the very beginning because dictionaries, as I've said before, don't have a specific order to them. So this is basically just printed out randomly. If we wanted a cleaner display of the items in a dictionary, then we could use the pprint function in the pprint module. This will do a pretty print of the dictionary. So let's modify this program a little bit. Go to the very start, and I'll just import the pprint module to get that pretty printing function. And here I will call pprint modules pprint function to do a pretty print. That's basically the same thing as print, except when you pass it something like a list or a dictionary, it'll do a much nicer looking output of everything. You can see all the keys are in order, and it's all in a single column. That's nicer than just having it all bunched together. The pprint module also has a pformat function, which will return the string of what this function, the pprint function, normally prints out. So if you just wanted this as a string, instead of being printed to the screen, you could call the pprint.pformat function. And then I'll just save this to a variable called rjText. And maybe later you could print out rjText. This is basically doing what the pprint function does, or do something else with that string. To recap, dictionaries contain key value pairs. Keys are like a list indexes. Dictionaries are mutable, so variables hold references to dictionary values. They don't actually hold the dictionary value itself. And dictionaries are unordered. There's no first key value pair in a dictionary, like a list has a first item. The keys, values, and items method will return list-like values of a dictionary's keys, values, and both keys and values. The get method can return a default value if the key doesn't exist, and the set default method can set a default value if a key doesn't exist. The pprint module's pprint function is a pretty print function that can display a dictionary value very cleanly and nicely. If you want that as a string, you can call the pformat function instead. Welcome to Lesson 17, which roughly covers pages 104 to 112 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to cover the dictionary data type. Like a list, a dictionary is a collection of many values. But unlike list indexes, indexes for dictionaries can use many different data types, not just integers. Indexes for dictionaries are called keys, and a key with its associated value is called a key value pair. Let's type in a small dictionary and save it to the mycat variable. 
So in code, a dictionary is typed with curly braces. Inside the braces are the key value pairs. So I'll have a string value for a key, then have a colon, and its value will be the string value fat. And you can have multiple key value pairs by separating them with commas. So I'll have another key and its value, and another key and its value. This dictionary's keys are the strings size, color, and disposition. The values are fat, gray, and loud. And this will just be a dictionary value that describes my cat, so I store it in a variable named my cat. You can access these values through their keys, just like a list. So square bracket, and then I'll type the key, and this evaluates to that key's value in the dictionary. So you can use this in any expression, like I'll just have some string concatenation here to create this string, my cat has gray fur. And dictionaries can still use integer values as keys, just like lists use integers for indexes, but they don't have to start at zero and they can be any number. So I can have a dictionary like one, two, three, four, five for the key, and its value will be the string luggage combination. And then maybe another key 42 for the value, the answer. Now, unlike lists, items in dictionaries are unordered. The first item in a list named spam would be spam zero. But there's no quote unquote first item in a dictionary. While the order of items matters for determining whether two lists are the same, such as comparing the list one, two, three with the list three, two, one. Oh, whoops. You can see these are false. Even though they have the same content, the order matters for lists. But for dictionaries, that's not the case. I could have something like x equals the dictionary name Zophie, species cat, age 8, and then have a different dictionary stored in the ham variable that has the exact same key value pairs, except in a different order. And Python will consider these to be the exact same dictionary. So dictionaries have no order. Dictionary might be a poor name for this data type because it's not like the keys are in alphabetical order like the words in a real dictionary, but you can think of the key value pair being like the word and definition pairs in a real dictionary. If you know the word, you can get the definition. If you know the key, you can get the value. Trying to access a key that doesn't exist in a dictionary will result in a key error error message, much like a lists out of range index error message. So if I tried something like eggs color, there is no color key in the eggs dictionary, so I get a key error. And you can check if a key exists in a dictionary value with the in and not in operators. So I can try to check if the name key or the name string value exists as a key in the dictionary in eggs. And it does. We have that right here. Or if I try the not in operator, I'll get false because it's false that name is not in the dictionary in eggs. Keep in mind that dictionaries are mutable, like lists. Variables hold references to dictionary values. Variables don't actually hold the dictionary value itself. And there are three dictionary methods that will return list-like values of the dictionary's keys, values, or both keys and values. And these are the keys method, Oop. the values method, and the items method, which actually returns a list of two item tuples of the key for the first item and the value as the second item. Now these methods actually return list-like data types. 
you can see actually the keys method returns a dict keys. So if you want an actual list value of the keys, you have to pass that value to the list function, and that'll return a list value. But you can use these methods in for loops, like if I say for k in eggs.keys, print k, then I can print them all out here. I can use each key in the eggs dictionary inside this for loop. And the same for all the values as well. You know, I have whatever code that uses the v variable that stores all the values. And I can use the multiple assignment trick and have multiple variables in the for loop for the items. So remember how items is actually returns two item tuples. The first item is the key and the second item is the value. And I can just store those in the k and v variables right here and then print them out. Otherwise, I would have the tuple values themselves assigned to the single variable, and it would print out these tuples. Just in case you missed it, uh, tuples are basically the exact same thing as lists, except they're immutable and they use parentheses instead of the square brackets. You can also use the in and not in operators to see whether a certain key or value exists in a dictionary. So we have this dictionary stored in eggs, and one of the values is the string cat. So I can check for that by saying cat in eggs.values. And that'll return true because the cat key, the cat value does exist inside this dictionary as one of the keys' values. Now it's really tedious to check whether a key exists in a dictionary before accessing the key's value. You want to avoid that key error error message. You know, if I say, oh, does the color key exist? No, and then this error will crash my program. So I'd have to have something like, if color in eggs, then do something with the uh, color key for that dictionary. And if this doesn't exist, then nothing is done, and that prevents the error message from happening. But it's really tedious to have this if statement every time. So Python gives us a get method that takes two arguments. And the first argument is the key of the value to retrieve, just like we have it color right here is the key that we wanted to retrieve. And then the second argument to the get method is a fallback default value that the method returns if that key doesn't exist in the dictionary. So let's take a look at the eggs dictionary right now. We can see we have the keys name, species, and age. And let's just call the get method and say, oh, we want to return the, key, the value for key age. And if it doesn't exist, return zero. But you can see it returns eight because the key, because the dictionary does have the key age. However, we could say, uh, get the color keys value. And if do that doesn't exist, then just return the blank string. And you can see since the color key doesn't exist inside this dictionary, it will go ahead and default to this second argument that we passed, so it returns a blank string. This is really handy if you have some dictionary that's keeping track of, say, how many things you're bringing to a picnic, and then you have some code that says, I am bringing uh, however many numbers of things. But if you're not bringing anything, you want to return a default value. So in this case, returning the integer 0 to the picnic. And I'm going to have to first convert this into a string in order to do string concatenation on it. So you can see, because napkins doesn't exist inside this dictionary, we just return the default value. So it says, I am bringing zero to the picnic. I guess I could say bringing zero napkins to the picnic. So if we didn't have the get method, we just tried to do this with the normal square bracket syntax. Anytime we try that on a key that doesn't exist, we would end up with a key error error message. The opposite of the get method is the set default method. 
you'll often have to set a value in a dictionary for a certain key only if that key doesn't already have a value. The code looks something like this. I have my eggs dictionary, and it has the keys name, species, age, if color not in eggs, eggs color equals black. So this will set the color key to the string value black, but only if it doesn't already have some setting in the eggs dictionary. And the set default method offers a way to do this in one line of code. I'll just reset the eggs dictionary. And instead, we can just call the set default method. Say, I want to set the color key only if it's not already set so that it defaults to black. So now you can see there's a key value pair color and the value is the string black. Now, if we try to set this to something different, say, set this to orange, this actually doesn't change anything because the color key already exists. It has the setting black right here. So calling set default doesn't do anything. It doesn't change it to orange. The set default method is a nice shortcut to ensure that a key exists. So let's create a short program that counts the number of occurrences of a letter in a string. Go ahead and open the file editor by clicking File, New File. And I'm going to save this as character count dot py. So we'll have a variable called message and this will keep the string that we want to have the letters counted. So how about It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. We'll just have a dictionary that contains key value pairs of where the keys are each letter and the value is how many a times it appears in this message variable. So we might have a key value pair like R is the key and then the value is 12 if the letter R appears in this string 12 times. So we'll just loop through each character in the message variable. Remember, a string is a list-like value, so we can use it in a for loop. And on each iteration of loop, the character variable here will be assigned a single letter from this variable message. But remember, the count dictionary starts off completely empty. It doesn't have any keys in it. But we want to make sure that it starts off at zero before we start counting that particular letter. So we'll call the set default method and say, okay, for whatever letter you have, start it off with a value of zero. So on the first iteration, when this capital I is assigned to character, we call count.setDefault and it says, hey, if you don't have the letter I as a key, go ahead and create that key value pair and make the value zero. And that ensures that there's no error on this next line when we have, let's update the count for that character to be equal to its current value plus one. And that's the entire, that's the entire for loop. Now at the very end of the program, we'll just print out count. So I'm gonna save that and then run it. And you can see this program has quickly gone through the entire string and just counted up all the letters for us. So the lowercase w appears two times, the uppercase I appears once. Now this program isn't completely ideal because we have lowercase a's counted separately from uppercase a's. So let's just change this slightly. Instead of going through the string in message, let's call message is upper method and then go through that string. So it's basically going through an uppercased version of this string. I'll save that, press F5 to run. And now we can see, ah, okay, so there are five a's because all of the lowercase a's have been converted to uppercase. Now, if we didn't have this set default method, I'll just comment that out and then save it and then run it, we would get an error message because the first time that we try to increment a count that doesn't exist, the, the key that doesn't exist, then we're gonna get that key error. Now, this program will work no matter what string is inside the message variable, even if that string is thousands or millions of characters long. In fact, let's try that out. 
I'm going to go to the automate the boring stuff.com slash files slash rj.txt and this is a text file of the entire text of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And I'll just hit control A to select all and control C to hit copy. I'll go back to my program and I'll change this. Now there's unescaped quotes inside this Romeo and Juliet text. So I'm going to have to use a special trick of the triple quotes, which is Python's multi-line string that you'll learn about in a couple lessons from now. But basically the triple quotes allow you to escape everything automatically and have the string go across multiple lines. And then I'll just end that with another triple quote. So this is one giant, one giant string that's being assigned to message. And then the rest of the program is just the same as before. Press F5 to run this, and you can see instantly Python has gone through this giant string and counted up all of this. We can see that in this particular text, there's 11,051 letter T's in the entire Romeo and Juliet text. Now this output is kind of messy. This is just printing out the dictionary value itself. If we actually wanted the letter A, it's going to be buried somewhere in the middle here and not at the very beginning because dictionaries, as I've said before, don't have a specific order to them. So this is basically just printed out randomly. If we wanted a cleaner display of the items in a dictionary, then we could use the pprint function in the pprint module. This will do a pretty print of the dictionary. So let's modify this program a little bit, go to the very start, and I'll just import the pprint module to get that pretty printing function. And here I will call pprint modules pprint function to do a pretty print. That's basically the same thing as print, except when you pass it something like a list or a dictionary, it'll do a much nicer looking output of everything. You can see all the keys are in order and it's all in a single column. That's nicer than just having it all bunched together. The pprint module also has a pformat function which will return the string of what this function, the pprint function, normally prints out. So if you just wanted this as a string instead of being printed to the screen, you could call the pprint.pformat function. And then I'll just save this to a variable called rjText. And maybe later you could print out rjText. This is basically doing what the pprint function does, or do something else with that string. To recap, dictionaries contain key value pairs. Keys are like a list indexes. Dictionaries are mutable, so variables hold references to dictionary values. They don't actually hold the dictionary value itself. And dictionaries are unordered. There's no first key value pair in a dictionary, like a list has a first item. The keys, values, and items method will return list-like values of a dictionary's keys, values, and both keys and values. The get method can return a default value if the key doesn't exist, and the set default method can set a default value if a key doesn't exist. The pprint module's pprint function is a pretty print function that can display a dictionary value very cleanly and nicely. If you want that as a string, you can call the pformat function instead. Welcome to lesson 18, which roughly covers pages 112 to 117 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. This lesson covers the topic of data structures. Lists and dictionaries are powerful ways to organize data into structures that your programs can handle. For example, I could have a dictionary that stored information about a cat, say, store this in a variable called cat, and the dictionary just contains data describing my cat. Color gray. And this is kind of nice simplified version of my cat Zofi, but it's a version that a Python program could understand. I could also have a list of these dictionaries, say all cats, which starts off as a blank dictionary. I could call the append method and then have a list with this dictionary. In fact, I could have a list of multiple of these dictionaries for all my various cats. Puka, who is five years old, 
always has black fur and fat tail who is also age five who is gray and that random stray cat that comes around the backyard i don't know its age i'll just put negative one orange i actually don't have this many cats now the all cats variable could be used in some cat related program this list of dictionaries is called a data structure. We can use data structures to model real world things in a way that our programs can understand. As an example, let's take a look at a tic-tac-toe program that I wrote. Here's the source code for it. It's uh, just under 200 lines of code. When I run it, it looks like this. Do you want to be X or O? X. I'll just go in the top left. Mid right. Uh oh, I'm kind of trapped here. I'll just block in the low middle section. Uh, and the computer has beaten you. Do you want to play again? No. So, this is a really simple program, but how do we represent a tic tac toe board like this using lists and dictionaries and basically put it into a version that we could stuff it into a Python variable? And the answer is, we use data structures to create a representation of this tic-tac-toe board. In this case, this is really simple. You can use string values to represent what's in each slot of the board. So x, 0, or a single space character. And so you'll need to store nine strings for each of the nine spaces. So we can use a dictionary of values for this. The x, o, and space can be the values, and the keys can be these strings for top left, top middle, top right, and then the middle row, and the lower row. This dictionary is a data structure that represents a tic-tac-toe board. So let's store this in a variable named the board. So the board, and this will be a dictionary. We have a key that's top left, and that'll just start off as a single space to show that it's an empty space that doesn't have X or O. And then top middle, top right. And I'm just going to copy and paste the rest of this. So here we have the board. We can go ahead and pretty print this as well using the preprint module. Oh, whoops, I accidentally set this x right here. I can change that. And set that back to a single space. There we go. So right now, this dictionary value, remember, Python just sees this as a dictionary with strings for keys and values for the key value pairs value. It doesn't actually see this as a tic-tac-toe board. I mean, it has no concept of this hashtag symbol drawn on a sheet of paper and people drawing zeros and x's and whatever. To Python, it's just a basic dictionary. But we can have our program use this to represent a tic-tac-toe board. So currently, this represents an empty tic-tac-toe board. All of these are just single empty spaces. But we could change this. Let's set that middle space back to an x equals x. So now when we print this out, everything's blank except for the x. So now this dictionary value, remember it's just a typical dictionary value, but our program can treat it as a tic-tac-toe board that looks like this with an x in the center. And we can keep changing around this dictionary to represent the board any way that we want. So let's just set the top to be all O's. And maybe we'll have the mid left position be set to X. Uh, 
and also the lower right also be set to X. So now this is what the dictionary looks like. And this dictionary value is a data structure for this tic-tac-toe board in which we can see, oh, the O player has won the game because they have three in a row. So we'd have to write code that can recognize whenever there's three in a row inside this dictionary value. But remember, in the tic-tac-toe game, we didn't have just printing out this dictionary value. We had a nicer display right here where it actually drew out a tic-tac-toe board for us. So how do we convert our dictionary into this output? And well, we can write a function for it. So this function can be print board, and it'll just take one of these tic-tac-toe dictionary data structures as the value for its parameter in board. And we can just use a bunch of print statements to print out all those uh, line characters, as well as the X's and O's. So here we'll print out the top row right here. So just print out whatever is in the top L position, and plus that vertical line. Another vertical line. And then the top right. And this will print out the first row. And we need that horizontal line. So two, three, four, five. We'll need something to print out the middle row, which the code looks pretty similar. So I'll just copy and paste this and then change this to mid. And we need another horizontal row and then the bottom row. So there we have it. This data structure for the tic-tac-toe board. We also have a function with code that treats that data structure and turns it into something that we humans can recognize. So when I call print board and I pass it this variable, the board, it'll print out that same tic-tac-toe board that we recognize. So this output can be as sophisticated as, as we want. We could have some fancy graphics if we had some sort of graphics library to do this fancy drawing and maybe make it 3D with lines that actually look like solid objects or anything like this. This is just using what we know, the print function to print out strings, to draw a simple tic-tac-toe board using these horizontal and vertical line characters from the keyboard. Because you created a data structure to represent a tic-tac-toe board and wrote code to interpret that data structure, you now have a program that models the tic-tac-toe board. This isn't a complete tic-tac-toe game, but you can see how a computer program can have a representation of something that just isn't a string or a simple integer. Lists and dictionaries allow you to combine and organize values to represent real-world objects. And last, let's learn about the type function. You can pass any value to the type function and it'll tell you the data type of that value. This can be really helpful in the interactive shell when you need to identify what kind of value you're dealing with. So you can see send type the integer 42 and it replies with int. Or I can pass it a string, or reply string, or a float. But then I could also pass it something like the board, and it says that's a dictionary. Oh, well, how about this value? And it'll say, oh, that's a string. So we can tell that the value at this key is a string value. So the type function, along with that pretty print function, are really handy to use in the interactive shell when you just need to see what data you have. Welcome to Lesson 18, which roughly covers pages 112 to 117 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. This lesson covers the topic of data structures. Lists and dictionaries are powerful ways to organize data into structures that your programs can handle. For example, I could have a dictionary that stored information about a cat, say, store this in a variable called cat, and the dictionary just contains data describing my cat. color, 
Prey. And this is kind of nice. Simplified version of My Cat Zophie, but it's a version that a Python program could understand. I could also have a list of these dictionaries, say all cats, which starts off as a blank dictionary. I could call the append method. And then have a list with this dictionary. In fact, I could have a list of multiple of these dictionaries for all my various cats. Puka, who is five years old, who is, has black fur, and Fat Tail, who is also age five, who is gray. And that random stray cat that comes around the backyard. I don't know its age. I'll just put negative one. Orange. I actually don't have this many cats. Now, the all cats variable could be used in some cat related program. This list of dictionaries is called a data structure. We can use data structures to model real world things in a way that our programs can understand. As an example, let's take a look at a tic tac toe program that I wrote. Here's the source code for it. It's uh, just under 200 lines of code. When I run it, it looks like this. Do you want to be X or O? X. I'll just go in the top left. Mid right. Oh, oh, I'm kind of trapped here. I'll just block in the low middle section. Oh, and the computer has beaten you. Do you want to play again? No. So this is a really simple program, but how do we represent a tic-tac-toe board like this using lists and dictionaries and basically put it into a version that we could stuff it into a Python variable? And the answer is we use data structures to create a representation of this tic-tac-toe board. In this case, this is really simple. You can use string values to represent what's in each slot of the board. So x, 0, or a single space character. And so you'll need to store nine strings for each of the nine spaces. So we can use a dictionary of values for this. The x, o, and space can be the values, and the keys can be these strings for top left, top middle, top right, and then the middle row and the lower row. This dictionary is a data structure that represents a tic-tac-toe board. So let's store this in a variable named the board. So the board, and this will be a dictionary. We have a key that's top left. And that'll just start off as a single space to show that it's an empty space. It doesn't have X or O. And then top middle, top right. And I'm just going to copy and paste the rest of this. So here we have the board. We can go ahead and pretty print this as well using the preprint module. Oh, whoops, I accidentally set this X right here. I can change that. And set that back to a single space. There we go. So right now, this dictionary value, remember, Python just sees this as a dictionary with strings for keys and values for the key value pairs value. It doesn't actually see this as a tic-tac-toe board. I mean, it has no concept of this hashtag symbol drawn on a sheet of paper and people drawing zeros and x's and whatever. To Python, it's just a basic dictionary. But we can have our program use this to represent a tic-tac-toe board. So currently, this represents an empty tic-tac-toe board. All of these are just single empty spaces. But we could change this. Let's set that middle space back to an X. equals x. Now when we print this out, everything's blank except for the x. 
So now this dictionary value, remember it's just a typical dictionary value, but our program can treat it as a tic-tac-toe board that looks like this with an X in the center. And we can keep changing around this dictionary to represent the board any way that we want. So let's just set the top to be all O's. And maybe we'll have the mid left position be set to X. And also the lower right also be set to X. So now this is what the dictionary looks like. And this dictionary value is a data structure for this tic-tac-toe board, in which we can see, oh, the O player has won the game because they have three in a row. So we'd have to write code that can recognize whenever there's three in a row inside this dictionary value. But remember, in the tic-tac-toe game, we didn't have just printing out this dictionary value. We had a nicer display right here, where it actually drew out a tic-tac-toe board for us. So how do we convert our dictionary into this output? And well, we can write a function for it. So this function can be print board, and it'll just take one of these tic-tac-toe dictionary data structures as the value for its parameter in board. And then we can just use a bunch of print statements to print out all those uh, line characters, as well as the X's and O's. So here we'll print out the top row right here. So just print out whatever is in the top L position, and plus that vertical line. Another vertical line. And then the top right. And this will print out the first row. And we need that horizontal line. So two, three, four, five. We'll need something to print out the middle row, which the code looks pretty similar. So I'll just copy and paste this and then change this to mid. And we need another horizontal row and then the bottom row. So there we have it. This data structure for the tic-tac-toe board. We also have a function with code that treats that data structure and turns it into something that we humans can recognize. So when I call print board and I pass it this variable, the board, it'll print out that same tic-tac-toe board that we recognize. So this output can be as sophisticated as, as we want. We could have some fancy graphics if we had some sort of graphics library to do this fancy drawing and maybe make it 3D with lines that actually look like solid objects or anything like this. This is just using what we know, the print function to print out strings, to draw a simple tic-tac-toe board using these horizontal and vertical line characters from the keyboard. Because you created a data structure to represent a tic-tac-toe board and wrote code to interpret that data structure, you now have a program that models the tic-tac-toe board. This isn't a complete tic-tac-toe game, but you can see how a computer program can have a representation of something that just isn't a string or a simple integer. Lists and dictionaries allow you to combine and organize values to represent real-world objects. And last, let's learn about the type function. You can pass any value to the type function and it'll tell you the data type of that value. This can be really helpful in the interactive shell when you need to identify what kind of value you're dealing with. So you can see send type the integer 42 and it replies with int. Or I can pass it a string, or reply string, or a float. But then I could also pass it something like the board and it says that's a dictionary. Oh, well, how about this value? And it'll say, oh, that's a string. So we can tell that the value at this key is a string value. So the type function, along with that 
pretty print function are really handy to use in the interactive shell when you just need to see what data you have. Welcome to lesson 19, which roughly covers pages 123 to 127 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. And text is one of the most common forms of data that your programs will handle. You already know how to concatenate two string values together with the plus operator, but Python can do much more than that. Let's take a look at some of the ways Python lets you write, print, and access strings in your code. Typing string values in Python code is fairly straightforward. They begin and end with a single quote. But then, how can you use a single quote that's inside of a string? For example, we have the string, that is Alice's cat. This doesn't work because Python thinks that the string ends after Alice because of this quote, and that the rest, this s cat, is just invalid Python code. Fortunately, there are multiple ways to type strings. Strings can begin and end with double quotes just as they do with single quotes. That is Alice's cat. One benefit of using double quotes is that a string can have a single quote character in it. Since the string begins with a double quote, Python is smart enough to know that a single quote is just part of the string, and it's not indicating the end of the string. However, if you need to use both single quotes and double quotes inside of a string, you'll need to use escape characters. An escape character lets you use characters that are otherwise impossible to put into a string. An escape character consists of a backslash, followed by a letter that represents which escape character you want to add to the string. For example, the escape character for a single quote is backslash quote. So I could have a string, say hi to Bob's mother. Python knows that since this single quote has a backslash before it, this is not a single quote meant to end the string value. Instead, it's saying put a literal single quote as part of the string. Table 6-1 in the Automate book shows the different types of escape characters you'll use. You can have them for single quotes, double quotes. If you want to have a tab or multiple spaces entered into your text, or if you want to have a new line, similar to hitting the enter key, or if you want to have a backslash itself, you can just have slash slash. So let's try out that new line character. Here, I'm just going to have something that's print, hello there, and then slash in for a new line character. How are you? Another new line. And then I'm fine, escaping that single quote. And this is how we can have a single print statement print out text across multiple lines. Now if you have text that includes many backslashes that you don't want seen as the beginning of an escape character, you can use a raw string. In Python, a raw string is the exact same as a normal string except it begins with a lowercase r right before it. So this is a valid Python string. So we can have something like, that is Carol's cat. And because this is a raw string, this is literally interpreted as part of the string. You can see when it's printed out as a string value, Python automatically adds that here. Let's try copying and pasting this into a print function call. And you can see right now, because this is a raw string, the backslashes are literally a part of the string. Raw strings are helpful if you're typing a string value that contains many backslashes, and this comes up in our lesson in the future about regular expressions. Now, while you can use slash in to put a new line into a string, it's often easier just to use multi-line strings. A multi-line string in Python begins and ends with either three single quote characters, or three double quote characters. So any quotes, tabs, or new lines in between the triple quotes are considered part of the string. So I could have something like print, begin a new multi-line, Dear Alice, Eve's cat has been arrested for catnapping, cat burglary, and extortion. Sincerely, Bob. 
and end that multi-line string. Now notice, I'm kind of breaking the rules of having one instruction per line right here. Python's smart enough to realize that, okay, this is all one quote-unquote line of code. This is just one function call. It doesn't matter that it's being split across multiple lines. I'm not creating any new blocks or anything like that. Python's smart enough to know, okay, until I see another triple quotes, everything here is part of the string, including all the new lines. So if we stored this string into a variable like spam, and we just wanted to display the string content inside spam, Python would automatically format it using the slash ins. So triple quotes are really handy if you have some gigantic string. Say I'm gonna create a new file editor window and just say, I want to copy and paste the entire text to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, which I happen to have right here in this text file. I can just hit Control A to select all and Control C to copy. And then Control V to paste it. And now any backslashes or single quotes or new lines that are inside all of this text are just automatically seen as part of the string. It's really unlikely that there's going to be a triple double quotes inside of this string. And if there are, and if there are I can just use the triple single quotes instead. Let me just end this. So all of this is just one giant variable assignment for the spam variable. And then I can just treat that string just like any other string. I could print it out. That's going to be a lot of output though. How about let's just print out what the length of this string is, just to see roughly how many characters are in it. I'll save this as example.py and press F5 to run it. Oh, okay. So that has 174,000 letters in it. Strings use indexes and slices the same way lists do. You can think of a string like hello world as kind of like a list-like value with each character being an item in that list. So if we had something like spam equals hello world, I could do all the same things with strings that I do with lists. So I could use indexes to pick out a single letter from it. I could use slices to pick out some substring from it. I could use the negative indexes to get the very last character. The in and not in operators also work with it. So hello in spam would evaluate to true since this text does exist inside that string. and see if the letter X appears in that string. It doesn't, so this evaluates to false. And note that this is case sensitive, so if I look for a capital hello inside that string, this will return false. To recap, strings can begin and end with double quotes just as they do single quotes. Escape characters let you put quotes and other characters that are hard to type inside your string code. Uh, raw strings will literally print any backslashes in the string and ignore escape characters. Multi-line strings begin and end with triple quotes, and they can span multiple lines. Indexes, slices, the in and not in operators all work with strings, just as they do with lists. Welcome to Lesson 19, which roughly covers pages 123 to 127 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Text is one of the most common forms of data that your programs will handle. You already know how to concatenate two string values together with the plus operator, but Python can do much more than that. Let's take a look at some of the ways Python lets you write, print, and access strings in your code. Typing string values in Python code is fairly straightforward. They begin and end with a single quote. But then, how can you use a single quote that's inside of a string? For example, we have the string, that is Alice's cat. This doesn't work because Python thinks that the string ends after Alice because of this quote, and that the rest, this s cat, is just invalid Python code. Fortunately, there are multiple ways to type strings. Strings can begin and end with double quotes just as they do with single quotes, that is Alice's cat. One benefit of using double quotes is that a string can have a single quote character in it. 
Since the string begins with a double quote, Python is smart enough to know that a single quote is just part of the string, and it's not indicating the end of the string. However, if you need to use both single quotes and double quotes inside of a string, you'll need to use escape characters. An escape character lets you use characters that are otherwise impossible to put into a string. An escape character consists of a backslash, followed by a letter that represents which escape character you want to add to the string. For example, the escape character for a single quote is backslash quote. So I could have a string say hi to Bob's mother. Python knows that since this single quote has a backslash before it, this is not a single quote meant to end the string value. Instead, it's saying put a literal single quote as part of the string. Table 6-1 in the automate book shows the different types of escape characters you'll use. You can have them for single quotes, double quotes. If you want to have a tab or multiple spaces entered into your text, or if you want to have a new line, similar to hitting the enter key, or if you want to have a backslash itself, you can just have slash slash. So let's try out that new line character. Here, I'm just going to have something that's print hello there, and then slash in for a new line character. How are you? Another new line. And then I'm fine, escaping that single quote. And this is how we can have a single print statement print out text across multiple lines. Now if you have text that includes many backslashes that you don't want seen as the beginning of an escape character, you can use a raw string. In Python, a raw string is the exact same as a normal string except it begins with a lowercase r right before it. So this is a valid Python string. So we can have something like, that is Carol's cat. And because this is a raw string, this is literally interpreted as part of the string. You can see when it's printed out as a string value, Python automatically adds that here. Let's try copying and pasting this into a print function call. And you can see right now, because this is a raw string, the backslashes are literally a part of the string. Raw strings are helpful if you're typing a string value that contains many backslashes, and this comes up in our lesson in the future about regular expressions. Now, while you can use slash in to put a new line into a string, it's often easier just to use multi-line strings. A multi-line string in Python begins and ends with either three single quote characters or three double quote characters. So any quotes, tabs, or new lines in between the triple quotes are considered part of the string. So I could have something like print, begin a new multi-line, Dear Alice, Eve's cat has been arrested for catnapping, cat burglary, and extortion. Sincerely, Bob. And end that multi-line string. Now notice, I'm kind of breaking the rules of having one instruction per line right here. Python's smart enough to realize that, okay, this is all one quote-unquote line of code. This is just one function call. It doesn't matter that it's being split across multiple lines. I'm not creating any new blocks or anything like that. Python's smart enough to know, okay, until I see another triple quotes, everything here is part of the string, including all the new lines. So if we stored this string into a variable like spam, and we just wanted to display the string content inside spam, Python would automatically format it using the slash ins. So triple quotes are really handy if you have some gigantic string. Say I'm gonna create a new file editor window and just say, I want to copy and paste the entire text to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet which I happen to have right here in this text file. I can just hit Control A to select all and Control C to copy. And then Control V to paste it. And now any backslashes or single quotes or new lines that are inside 
all of this text are just automatically seen as part of the string. It's really unlikely that there's going to be a triple double quotes inside of this string. And if there are, and if there are, I can just use the triple single quotes instead. Let me just end this. So all of this is just one giant variable assignment for the spam variable. And then I can just treat that string just like any other string. I could print it out. That's going to be a lot of output though. How about let's just print out what the length of this string is, just to see roughly how many characters are in it. I'll save this as example.py and press F5 to run it. Oh, okay. So that has 174,000 letters in it. Strings use indexes and slices the same way lists do. You can think of a string like hello world as kind of like a list-like value with each character being an item in that list. So if we had something like spam equals hello world, I could do all the same things with strings that I do with lists. So I could use indexes to pick out a single letter from it. I could use slices to pick out some substring from it. I could use the negative indexes to get the very last character. The in and not in operators also work with it, so hello in spam would evaluate to true, since this text does exist inside that string. And see if the letter X appears in that string. It doesn't, so this evaluates to false. And note that this is case sensitive, so if I look for a capital hello inside that string, this will return false. To recap, strings can begin and end with double quotes just as they do single quotes. Escape characters let you put quotes and other characters that are hard to type inside your string code. Uh, raw strings will literally print any backslashes in the string and ignore escape characters. Multi-line strings begin and end with triple quotes, and they can span multiple lines. Indexes, slices, the in and not in operators all work with strings just as they do with lists.
Welcome to Lesson 20, which roughly covers pages 128 to 141 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Just as a quick reminder, you can actually view the entire book online at automatetheboringstuff.com. So if you don't have a print copy, you can just scroll down and then click on whichever chapter that we're going over inside this class. And just like Lesson 15 covered a lot of useful list methods, this lesson will cover a lot of useful string methods. Keep in mind that, unlike list methods, the string methods return a new string value rather than modify the string in place. Since strings are immutable, it's impossible to modify them in place anyway. So let's take a look at the upper and lower string methods. I can have a variable like spam hello world, and I could call that string value's upper method, and it returns a uppercase version of that string. Now remember, String values are immutable, so they can't be modified in place. Spam still contains that lowercase value. If I actually wanted to modify the, the value in the variable spam, I would have to have something like spam equals spam.upper. And the lower method returns a version of that string in all lowercase. Non-letter characters like the space or the exclamation mark are completely unaffected by the upper and lower methods. These methods are helpful if you need to make a case-insensitive comparison. For example, if I was making some sort of game program and I printed out, do you want to play again, and I expected a yes or no answer, you would have some code that calls the input function, and then the player types in yes or no. Let's say I type in yes. Answer stores the lowercase yes string. The player could have easily typed in capital Y-E-S. Whoops. The player could have easily typed in capital Y-E-S. And so any code that we have that looks like this, if answer equals Y-E-S lowercase, it would fail because this expression evaluates to false if answer contains a capital contains an uppercase version of yes. So instead, we could have an expression that just automatically converts it to lowercase before doing the comparison. So now it doesn't matter if answer contains capital yes or maybe lowercase and uppercase characters. This line of code will still work the same. We can still have something like this. Whoops, still have something like this, and it works with any response. String values also have an isUpper and isLower method that returns a Boolean value depending on if the strings are uppercase or lowercase. So let me try again with storing hello world inside of spam. I can call spam isLower, and this will return false because there is a letter character that's in uppercase. So I could change this to be a lowercase letter. And now it returns, it evaluates to true. And I can do the same thing with is upper. I'll just first make this only have uppercase characters. And now spam is upper will return true. Note that if I just have the blank string, both spam.isUpper and isLower both return false. There needs to be at least one uppercase or one lowercase character for isUpper and isLower to return true, respectively. So if I just called this on a string value like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, both isLower and isUpper would return false because there's no letters inside this string. Now since the upper and lower string methods themselves return strings, you can call string methods on those return string values as well. Expressions that do this will look like a chain of method calls. So if I have the string hello, and I call its upper method, it returns the string capital hello. And then on that string, I could in turn call something like is upper, which then evaluates to a Boolean value. So this entire expression evaluates to true. We have the string hello, and then we call its string method upper on that, and this returns a string itself, which we call 
its method is upper, which then returns a Boolean value true. And there are several other of these string methods that begin with the word is. These methods return a Boolean value that describes the nature of the string. We have is alpha that returns true if the string consists of only letters and is not blank. Uh, is alnum, which returns true if the string only consists of letters and numbers, that is, it consists of alphanumerics. Uh, is decimal, which returns true if there are only numeric characters. Is space, that returns true if there's only space characters. And is title, that returns true if the string consists of words that begin with uppercase letters followed by only lowercase letters. So I'll type all of these out into the interactive shell. So we have the string is alpha, and this will return true because it only consists of letters. But if I have something like hello123, is alpha will return false because this 123 means that it's not just alphabetical characters. Whereas if I have hello123 and I call is alnum, which returns true if there's only alphanumerics, that is, letters and numbers only, then that returns true. I can have something like 123 and call is decimal on it, and that returns true. Or if I have just a bunch of empty space, I could call is space. That would say, yes, there's nothing but empty spa white space characters inside this string. Although, say I had something like hello world and called is space on that, that would return false because these are not space characters. However, if I had a if I had an expression sort of like, um, where is that space? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I could call is space on that, and that would return true because this index returns that single space from the middle in between hello and world. And then is title is kind of crazy looking. It will return true only if all of the words inside that string begin with an uppercase character and have nothing but lowercase characters in them. Whoops. There is also a corresponding title string method, just like there's lower and upper. So that's a lot of different string methods. You don't have to memorize all of them, just remember that they exist and you can Google for them later. Next, the starts with and ends with methods return true if a string value that they're called on begins or ends, respectively, with a string that's passed to the method. So if we had a string like hello world, we could call starts with and then pass that the string hello, and this will return true. We could even make that much simpler and say, does it start with the letter H? And that's true. Whereas this would return false because it does not start with LO. We need that beginning H right here. Similarly, we have an ends with method. And note that it starts with an S at the end and ends with an S at the end. So we could ask it, oh, does it end with world exclamation point? And this would return true. Of course, if we, although if we didn't have that exclamation mark at the end, this would return false. The join method is useful when you have a list of strings that need to be joined together into a single string value. The join method is called on a string, gets past a list of strings, and returns a string. So here's a common example. We have the string comma, and we'll use that to join together a list of strings. Let's say cats, rats, bats. So this method call returns a string that has each of these individual strings in this list combined together and joined with this string. So a comma appears in between each of them. We could change this so that we have nothing that joins them, just have the blank string so that they all just get crammed together already. Or perhaps we could have a single space in them so that there's a single space there. Or even say two new line characters. We'll have slash in slash in. So that way when we pass this to a print function call, it'll print it out with a new line here and then another new line here. 
to have a gap in between each of the words. The split method does the opposite. It's called on a string value and returns a list of strings. So I could have the string, my name is Simon. And when I call dot split on it, it returns a list, and inside this list are all the individual words from inside that string. It splits it on whitespace characters. Now we can have it split on other characters as well, just by passing a different value to the split method. Say I wanted it to split on the letter M instead of on spaces. Now this list will have my na as the first string, and then it splits, it cuts out this M so that everything up to the next M is in the second string, and then the rest of that is the third string. This is just like how it used to go up to the first space character and then have the next string be up to the next space character. So you can split on anything that you want. The rjust and ljust string methods will return a padded version of a string that they're called on, with spaces inserted to left justify or right justify the text. So the first argument to both methods is the integer length for the justified string. So if I have the string hello, I can right justify it. And let's say I want the total length of the return string to be 10. So in this case, Python inserts as many space characters as needed to make the total length of this string to be 10. And I can do the same thing with the ljust method to less left justify it. This will add white space padding to the end. And I can try passing it a different value to justify it with 20 spaces. And an optional second argument can be passed to rjust and ljust to specify a different fill character other than a space. So if I had hello dot rjust and I wanted it to be 20 characters long and then also have asterisks instead of spaces, I could create a string easily with stars at the front of it. Or say I wanted the text hello to be left justified with 25 characters and then dashes instead. And there's also a center method that works just like ljust and rjust but centers the text rather than justifying it to the left or right. So I can have hello and then center it so that the entire string is 20 characters long with the text in the center, or I could have maybe an equal sign as the fill character instead. This is kind of nice because you could have a variable that contains something like name equals al, or I could change that to be a very long name like Wendell. And that same code will put that name in the center with as many equal signs on either side as necessary. It uses the same code. Sometimes you might want to strip off whitespace characters like spaces or tabs or new lines uh, from the left side or the right side or both sides of the string. Going back, if we had this hello.rjust and we had too much space on the, on the left side of this and we want to get rid of that, we can call the strip string method to remove that. So let's say I had that in spam, and I could call strip on that string to remove that white space. Remember, this doesn't modify spam in place. Spam still has all of that in there. This just returns a brand new string. So if I wanted to change it, I would have spam equals spam.strip. That'll remove white space from either side of the string. But say we only wanted to move, remove the white space from the left side of the string, we could call lstrip, or we could call rstrip to just remove white space from the right side of the string. We could also pass these strip methods a string with characters that we want to remove instead of white space. So if I had a, a variable like spam spam bacon spam eggs spam spam, I could call strip on that and pass it the letters AMP capital S. I can have this in any order, I'm just specifying letters, not an actual word. 
and this will remove all the capital S's, P's, A's, and M's from either side of the string and return that new string value. Notice how there's still spam in the middle. That's just because it removed those letters up to the first character that wasn't passed to the strip method. And then the same on the N side. It just went down to here. So this is the string that was returned. The replace string method takes two arguments, a string to look for and a string to replace it with. So if I had a string like hello there stored in spam, I could call replace and replace every E with XYZ. And that's all the string methods that we'll cover in this lesson. Let's go over one more thing. The Piperclip module has copy and paste functions that can send text to and receive text from your computer's clipboard. So sending the output of your program to the clipboard will make it really easy to paste it to an email or to a word processor software or some other program. Piperclip doesn't come with Python. To install it, follow the directions for installing third-party modules with the pip tool in Appendix A. I can show you very quickly how to do it on Windows. I'm just going to hit Window key R and run CMD. And I'll just go to the directory. So change directory to where Python is installed and go to its scripts folder. And that has this program pip.exe. And I'll just type pip.exe install Piperclip. And this will automatically download and install it onto your system. In this case, I've already have it, I already have it installed, so it says, oh, you don't need to install it again. So after installing it, you can check to see if the install worked by just trying to import Piperclip. And if nothing shows up, uh, then that means it's successfully been installed. And Piperclip has a copy and paste functions that can copy text to the clipboard. So say I can copy this string hello with lots of exclamation marks. And now when I try to paste text, I can see that this text was indeed copied to the clipboard. Or I can call Piperclip's paste function, and that will return the text that's already on the clipboard. So if I wanted to get that as a string value, I can just call Piperclip.paste. To recap, upper and lower return an uppercase or lowercase uh, version of the string is upper, is lower, is alpha, is alnum, is decimal, is uh, space, is title. All of those is string methods return true or false depending on if the string is that respective kind of string. Uh, starts with and ends with also return bools. The join method will return a string that combines the strings from a list. Uh, the split method will return a list of strings. Rjust, Ljust, and Center will return a string that's padded with spaces or some other character that you specify. The strip, rstrip, and lstrip methods will return a string with the white space stripped off from the sides. A replace will replace all occurrences of the first string argument with the second string argument that you pass it. And the Piperclip module has copy and paste functions so that your programs can use the computer's clipboard. Welcome to lesson 21. In this short lesson, we'll talk about string formatting. Normally, when you want to combine strings together to form a single string value, you can use the plus operator to concatenate strings together. For example, we can have hello plus the string world, and that evaluates to the single string value hello world. Now, this can get tricky if you have several strings that you need to concatenate. Let's create several variables. Let's have name equals the string Alice. Place is Main Street. Uh, time is the string 6 p.m. Uh, food is the string turnips. And then we have a large string that we want to concatenate all of these together with. And it'll look like a simple invitation. So we can have hello plus name plus you are invited to a party at, and then we'll concatenate the place variable, and then add at plus time plus period, please bring, and then plus food, and then plus for that final period. So that evaluates to hello Alice, 
Alice, you are invited to a party at Main Street at 6 p.m. Please bring turnips. Sounds like a great party, huh? Anyway, this expression right here looks really complicated. We had to type a lot of quotes, a lot of pluses. Uh, it's kind of hard to read as well. So Python has something called string formatting. It's also called string interpolation. And this lets us put a percent %s inside of a string to mark where we want to have other strings inserted into it. I'll show you what I mean. So we could have this exact same expression typed out like this. Hello, and then instead of this end quote plus name plus and then another quote, we can just have percent %s. And we can type out the rest of the string. You are invited to a party at percent %s at percent %s. Please bring percent %s and then period. And then after that string, we can have a percent sign followed by parentheses, and inside the parentheses we'll have a comma delimited list of variables that we want to have inserted at these percent %s's. These percent %s's are called conversion specifiers. So we can have the string in name be assigned, uh, be inserted at the first percent %s, and then we can have place, time, and food. And this evaluates to the exact same thing that this huge string concatenation expression evaluated to. Hello Alice, you are invited to a party at Main Street at 6 p.m. Please bring turnips. Now this string is a lot easier to read. And we can put all of these strings that we want to insert inside of it at the end after this percent and then have it inside parentheses. By using string formatting, you can make your code a lot more readable. Welcome to lesson 21. In this short lesson, we'll talk about string formatting. Normally, when you want to combine strings together to form a single string value, you can use the plus operator to concatenate strings together. For example, we can have hello plus the string world, and that evaluates to the single string value hello world. Now, this can get tricky if you have several strings that you need to concatenate. Let's create several variables. Let's have name equals the string Alice, place is Main Street, uh, time is the string 6 p.m., uh, food is the string turnips, and then we have a large string that we want to concatenate all of these together with. It'll look like a simple invitation. So we can have hello plus name plus you are invited to a party at, and then we'll concatenate the place variable, and then add at plus time plus period, please bring, and then plus food, and then plus for that final period. So that evaluates to, hello Alice, Alice you are invited to a party at Main Street at 6 p.m., please bring turnips. Sounds like a great party, huh? Anyway, this expression right here looks really complicated. We had to type a lot of quotes, a lot of pluses. Uh, it's kind of hard to read as well. So Python has something called string formatting. It's also called string interpolation. And this lets us put a percent %s inside of a string to mark where we want to have other strings inserted into it. I'll show you what I mean. So we could have this exact same expression typed out like this. Hello. And then instead of this end quote plus name plus and then another quote, we can just have percent %s. And we can type out the rest of the string. You are invited to a party at percent %s at percent %s. Please bring percent %s and then period. And then after that string, we can have a percent sign followed by parentheses. And inside the parentheses, we'll have a comma delimited list of variables that we want to have inserted at these percent %s's. These percent %s's are called conversion specifiers. So we can have the string in name be assigned, uh, be inserted at the first percent %s, and then we can have place, time, and food. And this evaluates to the exact same thing that this huge string concatenation expression evaluated to. Hello Alice, you are invited to a party at Main Street at 6 p.m. Please bring turnips. Now this string is a lot easier to read. 
and we can put all of these strings that we want to insert inside of it at the end after this percent and then have it inside parentheses. By using string formatting, you can make your code a lot more readable. Welcome to lesson 22. In this lesson, we'll talk about how to run your Python scripts from outside of idle. This content mostly comes from Appendix B of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, which you can read at automatetheboringstuff.com slash Appendix B. First, congratulations. At this point, you know all of the basic programming concepts. The rest of this course is just learning how to use various modules to do cool stuff and automate various kinds of tasks. So you'll soon be writing these programs. Let's figure out a convenient way to run them. It's inconvenient to have to launch idle, open your Python script, and then press F5 every time you want to run them. There are faster ways to run your Python scripts, though unfortunately they're different for Windows, Mac, and Linux. This lesson covers Windows only, but it also has some information that applies to all three operating systems. The first line of all of your Python programs should be a shebang line. I'm going to create a new file editor window, and the shebang line begins with pound symbol, exclamation mark, but the rest depends on your operating system. On Windows, the shebang line is Python 3. On OS 10, it's slash user slash bin slash env space Python 3. And on Linux, it's slash user slash bin slash Python 3. I'm on Windows, so I'm just going to be typing Python 3. So on Windows, the py.exe program will read the shebang line at the top of the .py file source code and run the appropriate version of Python for that script. Now, strictly speaking, you don't really need the shebang line on Windows, but it does tell Python to use a version 3 version of Python instead of version 2, just in case you have multiple versions of Python installed on your computer. I'm going to make this a simple hello world program. And then let's save this in a brand new folder. Let's go to the C drive, then the users folder, and then click on your accounts folder. My username is Al. And then click on new folder and create a new folder called my Python scripts. And inside this folder, save your hello.py program. And this folder will be a convenient place to store all of your Python scripts. Now let's try running this Hello World program from outside of idle. I'm just going to go ahead and close idle completely. And on Windows, you can press the Windows key R, and that'll bring up the Run dialog. Here, just type CMD, and this will bring up a new command prompt window. Now this is used for many things besides just Python. And it's really not as user-friendly as a graphical user interface that most users use. But here, we can run the py.exe program and then give it our Python script. And we have to provide the full uh, path. So c colon slash uh, users. I can type in just the first few characters of the folder and press tab and do tab completion. So I don't even have to type in everything. So slash al slash scripts slash hello.py. And there, now I've run the program from outside of idle. You can see all of those print function calls just go out here to the command prompt window instead of to the interactive shell. Now this is handy because you don't have to open idle, then open the program, then hit F5, but right now it's kind of tedious to specify the full file path, and also it's kind of tedious to open up this command prompt window. So I'm going to close this. We can actually just run this Python script from the run dialog itself. So hit Windows key R and type pi. And for .exe programs, you don't even have to type the .exe. You can just type pi. And then type out the full user, uh, the full path, slash users, slash al, slash scripts slash hello.py. And this is basically the same thing as running this command from the command line. And I can press Enter and then run the program. And whoa, that was really quick. So if you didn't blink, you might have seen a window briefly open and close. Let's try that again. Windows key, then press Enter. And the reason that happened is because the command prompt window that displayed Hello World closes as soon as the Python script ends. That doesn't really give us a lot of time to see the contents, though. We can open a command prompt window ourselves by typing CMD and 
try typing pause.exe just to run this pause program that comes with Windows. It shows press any key to continue, and then it pauses until we press a key on the keyboard. Now it'd be great if we could run our Python program, and then at the end of it, run this pause.exe program so that the window doesn't instantly close. So we need a way to run both of these commands, and we can do this with batch files. Batch files are also called shell scripts in other operating systems, and they basically let you run multiple commands by just running the batch file. All a batch file is is just a text file with the commands uh, save to a file that ends with .bat. We can use idle's file editor to make this. So I'll just start up idle again and create a new file editor window. And we'll use this to create our batch file. So type in the following, at symbol pi, c colon slash users slash al slash my python scripts slash hello.py space percent sign asterisk. And then on a new line, have at symbol pause. So this first line is going to run our Python script. The at symbol basically tells Windows, I don't actually want you to display this entire line when you run this program. I just want you to do it. And the percent asterisk tells Windows, oh yeah, forward any command line arguments to this Python program. And I'll explain what command line arguments are in a bit. And the second line calls that, that pause.exe program so that the window doesn't instantly disappear on us. So let's click on File and Save As, and save it in that same my Python scripts folder. So users, oh, users, al, uh, my Python scripts, and then just save this as hello.bat, and this is really important, change the save as type to be all files, otherwise idle will helpfully automatically add the .py file extension, which is not what we want. Now this makes it a bit easier to run our program. Now we can just hit Windows key R and then run that batch file, which is in C colon slash users slash al slash my Python scripts slash hello dot bat. And we can see it's run that hello world Python program and it's now also running that pause.exe program so that we can wait and see all of the output here. And once we're done, we can just uh, press the space key or any other key to close that out. If you don't want the, that pause at the end, you can just get rid of this pause line. In fact, if your program doesn't have any output to the screen, you can just use, you can get rid of that pause line and then also just call the pyw program instead of pi. This runs a windowless Python that doesn't make that command line appear this runs a windowless Python that doesn't make the command line window appear at all. So for example, if you've made a program that just uses text that you've copied to the clipboard for input, and then replaces that text on the clipboard with some new text, and it doesn't actually display any output or, or any text to the screen, uh, using the pyw program might be nicer because then you can just run it and then it won't even briefly flicker that command, uh, command line window. It's still annoying to have to type out that full path at the run dialog though. We can actually shorten this a little bit because Windows doesn't require that you type out the .bat part when you, run, when you want to run a batch file, but we still have to type the rest of this. But we can shorten this entirely to just hello by adding that my Python scripts folder to the path environment variable. Environment variables are kind of like variables for your operating system. All the major operating systems use environment variables, in particular one called path, which is just a list of folders. Right now if you tried to run this hello, uh, Windows would give you some error saying that it can't actually find the file that you're talking about. But we can add that mypython scripts folder to the path, and that will make Windows check it for any hello.bat files. So in order to do that, let's click on the Windows Start button and go to the control panel, go down to system, and then click on advanced system settings. This will bring up the system properties window, and on the advanced tab, click on environment variables. So under here where it says system variables, find the path environment variable and click on edit. And this is a super long string and they didn't really make this text field wide enough, 
but just click on, uh, just press the home key to go to the very beginning of it and then enter in that folder name. So c colon slash users slash al slash my Python scripts and then end it with a semicolon. That semicolon here just is the separator for all of these different folder names. And click on OK, and then click on OK, and click on OK, and close this. So now we've added our MyPython scripts folder to the path environment variable, and we only have to do that once. Even if you reboot your computer, that setting will be saved. That means now all we have to do is hit Windows key R, and we can just type hello and that'll run our program. So typing hello here runs the hello.bat batch file, and Windows knows to look in the MyPython scripts folder for this batch file because we've added it to the system path. And the first line of that batch file will run our program, and then after that program's done, it'll run this pause program, which makes press any key to continue appear, so that way the window doesn't disappear on us. The command line arguments are typed when you run your Python program. For example, if I ran hello and I could specify some command line arguments right here and separate them with spaces. Let's open up that hello.py file. These command line arguments, also called command line options, can be accessed in your code as a list of strings stored in the sys.argv variable. I'm just going to import the sys module and then print out that list by calling print sys.argv. And this is a list value of strings, one string for each command line argument. So I'll just click on save. And then I'll press Windows key R and I'll show you what I mean. I'll run that hello program and then pass it arg1, arg2, arg3. And this is that list that's stored in sys.argv. This is really handy if you have to specify just some extra ad additional information when you run your program. And these are string values, the ordinary kind that you're already familiar with. And that's the reason we needed this percent asterisk, because normally right now, when we're typing out hello arg1, arg2, arg3, this is actually passing those command line options to the hello batch file. So this percent star tells that batch file to in turn forward them to our hello.py program. So now we have it set up so that we can easily run our Python programs. We've set up the path environment variable, which we only have to do once. And then for each of our programs, we just have to create a batch file in that my Python scripts folder that follows this simple formula, just running pi with the at symbol in front of it, running that Python program using percent star to pass it, to forward any command line options to it, and then pausing afterwards so that that window doesn't instantly disappear. Now these are the steps for Windows. You can see the course notes for similar steps for Mac and Linux. To recap, the shebang line tells your computer that you want to run the script using Python 3. On Windows, you can bring up the Run dialog by pressing Windows key R. A batch, file, a batch file can save you a lot of typing by running multiple commands. And the batch files you'll make will look like this. At symbol pi, the script name, percent asterisk, and then at symbol pause. And you'll need to add the MyPythonScripts folder to the path environment variable first. You only have to do that once. And command line arguments, also called command line options, can be read from your Python programs in the sys.argv list. Welcome to lesson 22. In this lesson, we'll talk about how to run your Python scripts from outside of idle. This content mostly comes from Appendix B of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook, which you can read at automatetheboringstuff.com slash Appendix B. First, congratulations. At this point, you know all of the basic programming concepts. The rest of this course is just learning how to use various modules to do cool stuff and automate various kinds of tasks. So you'll soon be writing these programs. Let's figure out a convenient way to run them. It's inconvenient to have to launch idle, open your Python script, and then press F5 every time you want to run them. There are faster ways to run your Python scripts 
though unfortunately they're different for Windows, Mac, and Linux. This lesson covers Windows only, but it also has some information that applies to all three operating systems. The first line of all of your Python programs should be a shebang line. I'm going to create a new file editor window, and the shebang line begins with pound symbol, exclamation mark, but the rest depends on your operating system. On Windows, the shebang line is Python 3. On OS 10, it's slash user slash bin slash env space Python 3. And on Linux, it's slash user slash bin slash Python 3. I'm on Windows, so I'm just going to be typing Python 3. So on Windows, the py.exe program will read the shebang line at the top of the .py file source code and run the appropriate version of Python for that script. Now, strictly speaking, you don't really need the shebang line on Windows, but it does tell Python to use a version 3 version of Python instead of version 2, just in case you have multiple versions of Python installed on your computer. I'm going to make this a simple Hello World program. And then let's save this in a brand new folder. Let's go to the C drive, then the users folder, and then click on your accounts folder. My username is Al. And then click on new folder and create a new folder called my Python scripts. And inside this folder, save your hello.py program. And this folder will be a convenient place to store all of your Python scripts. Now let's try running this Hello World program from outside of idle. I'm just going to go ahead and close idle completely. And on Windows, you can press the Windows key R, and that'll bring up the Run dialog. Here, just type CMD, and this will bring up a new command prompt window. Now this is used for many things besides just Python, and it's really not as user-friendly as a graphical user interface that most users use. But here, we can run the py.exe program and then give it our Python script. And we have to provide the full uh, path. So c colon slash uh, users. I can type in just the first few characters of the folder and press tab and do tab completion. So I don't even have to type in everything. So slash al slash scripts slash hello.py. And there, now I've run the program from outside of idle. You can see all of those print function calls just go out here to the command prompt window instead of to the interactive shell. Now this is handy because you don't have to open idle, then open the program, then hit F5, but right now it's kind of tedious to specify the full file path, and also it's kind of tedious to open up this command prompt window. So I'm going to close this. We can actually just run this Python script from the run dialog itself. So hit Windows key R and type pi. And for .exe programs, you don't even have to type the .exe. You can just type pi. And then type out the full user, uh, the full path, slash users, slash al, slash scripts slash hello.py. And this is basically the same thing as running this command from the command line. And I can press Enter and then run the program. And whoa, that was really quick. So if you didn't blink, you might have seen a window briefly open and close. Let's try that again. Windows key, then press Enter. And the reason that happened is because the command prompt window that displayed Hello World closes as soon as the Python script ends. That doesn't really give us a lot of time to see the contents, though. We can open a command prompt window ourselves by typing cmd and try typing pause.exe just to run this pause program that comes with Windows. It shows press any key to continue, and then it pauses until we press a key on the keyboard. Now it'd be great if we could run our Python program, and then at the end of it, run this pause.exe program so that the window doesn't instantly close. So we need a way to run both of these commands, and we can do this with batch files. Batch files are also called shell scripts in other operating systems, and they basically let you run multiple commands by just running the batch file. All a batch file is is just a text file with the commands uh, saved to a file that ends with .bat. We can use idle's file editor to make this. So I'll just start up idle again and create a new file editor window. 
and we'll use this to create our batch file. So type in the following, at symbol pi, c colon slash users slash al slash my python scripts slash hello.py space percent sign asterisk and then on a new line have at symbol pause. So this first line is going to run our Python script. The at symbol basically tells Windows, I don't actually want you to display this entire line when you run this program. I just want you to do it. And the percent asterisk tells Windows, oh yeah, forward any command line arguments to this Python program. And I'll explain what command line arguments are in a bit. And the second line calls that, that pause.exe program so that the window doesn't instantly disappear on us. So let's click on File and Save As, and save it in that same MyPython scripts folder. So users, oh, users, al, uh, MyPython scripts, and then just save this as hello.bat, and this is really important, change the save as type to be all files, otherwise idle will helpfully automatically add the .py file extension, which is not what we want. Now this makes it a bit easier to run our program. Now we can just hit Windows key R, and then run that batch file, which is in c colon slash users slash al slash mypython scripts slash hello.bat. And we can see it's run that hello world Python program, and it's now also running that pause.exe program so that we can wait and see all of the output here. And once we're done, we can just uh, press the space key or any other key to close that out. If you don't want the, that pause at the end, you can just get rid of this pause line. In fact, if your program doesn't have any output to the screen, you can just use, you can get rid of that pause line and then also just call the pyw program instead of pi. This runs a windowless Python that doesn't make that command line appear. This runs a windowless Python that doesn't make the command line window appear at all. So for example, if you've made a program that just uses text that you've copied to the clipboard for input, and then replaces that text on the clipboard with some new text, and it doesn't actually display any output or, or any text to the screen, uh, using the pyw program might be nicer because then you can just run it and then it won't even briefly flicker that command, uh, command line window. It's still annoying to have to type out that full path at the run dialog though. You can actually shorten this a little bit because Windows doesn't require that you type out the .bat part when you, run, when you want to run a batch file, but we still have to type the rest of this. But we can shorten this entirely to just hello by adding that my Python scripts folder to the path environment variable. Environment variables are kind of like variables for your operating system. All the major operating systems use environment variables, in particular one called path, which is just a list of folders. Right now if you tried to run this hello, uh, Windows would give you some error saying that it can't actually find the file that you're talking about. But we can add that my Python scripts folder to the path, and that will make Windows check it for any hello.bat files. So in order to do that, let's click on the Windows Start button and go to the Control Panel, go down to System, and then click on Advanced System Settings. This will bring up the System Properties window, and on the Advanced tab, click on Environment Variables. So under here where it says System Variables, find the Path Environment Variable and click on Edit. And this is a super long string and they didn't really make this text field wide enough. But just click on, uh, just press the home key to go to the very beginning of it, and then enter in that folder name. So c colon slash users slash al slash my Python scripts, and then end it with a semicolon. That semicolon here just is the separator for all of these different folder names. Then click on OK, and then click on OK, and click on OK, and close this. So now we've added our MyPython scripts folder to the path environment variable, and we only have to do that once. Even if you reboot your computer, that setting will be saved. That means now all we have to do is hit Windows key R, and we can just type hello, and that'll run our program. So typing hello here runs the hello.bat batch file, 
and Windows knows to look in the MyPython scripts folder for this batch file because we've added it to the system path. And the first line of that batch file will run our program, and then after that program's done, it'll run this pause program, which makes press any key to continue appear, so that way the window doesn't disappear on us. The command line arguments are typed when you run your Python program. For example, if I ran hello and I could specify some command line arguments right here and separate them with spaces. Let's open up that hello.py file. These command line arguments, also called command line options, can be accessed in your code as a list of strings stored in the sys.argv variable. I'm just going to import the sys module and then print out that list by calling print sys.argv. And this is a list value of strings, one string for each command line argument. So I'll just click on save. And then I'll press Windows key R and I'll show you what I mean. I'll run that hello program and then pass it arg1, arg2, arg3. And this is that list that's stored in sys.argv. This is really handy if you have to specify just some extra ad additional information when you run your program. And these are string values, the ordinary kind that you're already familiar with. And that's the reason we needed this percent asterisk, because normally right now, when we're typing out hello arg1, arg2, arg3, this is actually passing those command line options to the hello batch file. So this percent star tells that batch file to in turn forward them to our hello.py program. So now we have it set up so that we can easily run our Python programs. We've set up the path environment variable, which we only have to do once. And then for each of our programs, we just have to create a batch file in that mypythonscripts folder that follows this simple formula, just running pi with the at symbol in front of it, running that Python program using percent star to pass it, to forward any command line options to it, and then pausing afterwards so that that window doesn't instantly disappear. Now these are the steps for Windows. You can see the course notes for similar steps for Mac and Linux. To recap, the shebang line tells your computer that you want to run the script using Python 3. On Windows, you can bring up the run dialog by pressing Windows key R. A batch file, a batch file can save you a lot of typing by running multiple commands. And the batch files you'll make will look like this. At symbol pi, the script name, percent asterisk, and then at symbol pause. And you'll need to add the MyPython scripts folder to the path environment variable first. You only have to do that once. And command line arguments, also called command line options, can be read from your Python programs in the sys.argv list. Welcome to lesson 23, which roughly covers pages 147 to 151 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. You can find this textbook online for free at automatetheboringstuff.com. In this lesson, we will be dealing with pattern matching and regular expressions. You may be familiar with searching for text by pressing Ctrl F and typing in the words that you're looking for. Regular expressions take this one step further. They allow you to specify a pattern of text to search for. Regular expressions are sort of a simplified mini language for specifying text patterns. One example of a text pattern is a phone number. If you live in the United States or Canada, you know that a phone number will be three digits for an area code, followed by a dash, followed by three more digits, followed by another dash, followed by four more digits. And this is how you as a human can know that this is a phone number, while this number is not a phone number. Most modern text editors and word processors, such as Microsoft Word or OpenOffice, have find and find replace features that can search based on regular expressions. Right here under the special menu, I can specify a pattern of text, such as any digit or any letter. 
These are similar to what regular expressions are. Regular expressions are huge time savers. First I'll show you an example that doesn't use regular expressions, and you'll see how much code it takes just to recognize simple patterns. I'll create a new file editor window, and let's write a function called isPhoneNumber that takes some text string as an argument, and it'll return true if text is an American or Canadian style phone number and false if it's not. So here's the code. First we'll do a quick check just to see if it's 12 characters long. And if it's not, we can return false because we know that this is not phone number sized. And next, let's call isDecimal on each character at the indexes 0 to 3. So I'll have a for loop going from 0 up to, but not including 3, just so we get the first 3. And if text i is not uh, a decimal character, we can return false, because then we know that there's no area code. And also we have to check if the character at index 3 is not the dash. And if it's not, then we also return false there. And we'll have to check the next three characters after that to see if those are decimals, because that'll be you know, if we had a phone number, this will be the first three digits of the phone number that's not the area code. So we'll call is decimal. So if it's not a decimal numeric character, then we'll also return false. And then we'll check for that second dash at index three or I'm sorry, at index 7, and if it's not equal to a dash, we'll also return false, because it's missing that second dash. Then we'll have to loop over the characters from index 8 up to, but not including 12, and check if those are decimal characters as well. So we'll call is decimal on each of those characters, 8 to 11, and if it's if it returns false, then we want this to return false from our function because it's missing the last four digits. So if the execution manages to make it past all of these different checks, then we'll have our function return true. And I'll just save this as example.py. So we can run this program. Let's uh, first print out some uh, test results. So I'm going to call this function is phone number and I'll pass it the string 415-555-1234 and then I'll print out what the return value of is phone number is. So I'll press F5 and it returns true because this is in fact a phone number according to all of this code. But then if we change this to something like hello, then when we run this program our is phone number function returns false. This is a lot of code, and maybe you want to write a function that takes a large string and finds where in that string there is a phone number. You'd have to write some more code that can make use of this function. It would be something like, uh, let's start off with a message. Say our string that we want to check is the string, call me at 415-555-1011 tomorrow, or at 415-555-9999 for my office line. And so if we wanted to detect where in this string these phone numbers are, if there are any uh, phone numbers in that string, we'd have to write code like this. Uh, we'll just set up a variable named found number to be equal to false, and we'll set this variable to true once we've found a number, and then we'll just loop through every character in this message. We'll create a substring and we'll store that in a variable named chunk that is basically every 12 character long chunk from this big string, uh, string in message. So we'll use a slice for this, everything starting at i. So i will just be the starting index and go up to i plus 12. And since it's a slice, we don't have to worry about it going past the end index 
like we would if this was just a regular uh, index access. So i plus 12. So when i is 0, it'll grab the first 12 characters, and then when i is 1, it'll dr grab these 12 characters, and then when i is 2, it'll grab the next uh, 12 characters, and so on and so on, until finally it's looking at this string. So we need something that will call is phone number and check if chunk contains a phone number. So if is phone number chunk. So if this returns true, then we want to print, oh, uh, phone number found. And we'll just set found number equals true. And then here at the very end, we'll check if found number is set to false. And if so, then we can print out a little message that says, could not find any phone numbers. So we can run this by pressing F5. We can see this program has now found these phone numbers in this string. And remember, this string could be something huge, like we could just copy and paste all of the text from a web page and then put it in a multi-line string in our program and then just have it uh, go through that entire uh, large bit of text. But say there are no phone numbers, like we can get rid of the pattern but just by deleting a couple numbers here. And if we run this then, it'll just print out the message, could not find any phone numbers. So again, this is a lot of code. Um, you know, it, it uses all of the programming concepts that we're familiar with, you know, if, you know, functions, the length function, uh, indexes and slices and everything like that, but this is still a lot of effort that we would have to put in. And text pattern recognition is done so often in programming that programmers have developed regular expressions in order to help uh, shorten all of this into just a few lines of code. So in fact, I'm going to write a version of this code using regular expressions, and you'll see just how much shorter it is. So first we'll import the RE module, which has all the regular expression functions in it. And then I'll just get rid of all of this. And now we just have to create a regular expression object that we'll store in this phone num regex variable. And this is returned by the re.compile function, which we just pass it our uh, regular expression string, which is basically the text that defines the pattern that we're looking for. So we'll be using our uh, raw strings for this. This is just a standard string that begins with the lowercase letter r. And this means that whenever we use the backslash in this string, we're not actually doing a, uh, an escape character like for new line characters or t. And that's because regular expressions use a lot of backslashes in them. So the pattern that we're looking for will be slash d, which says we're looking for a digit. And in fact, we're looking for three digits. So I'll just add three of these there. We're also looking for a dash and then three more numeric digits and then another dash and then three more numeric digits. So this says, okay, we're creating, we're looking for this pattern of text and we'll store this as a regular expression object that's returned by compile. We'll store that regular expression object in this variable. And the regular expression data type has a search method, which we can then use to search a string, like this string, for this pattern. And this will return a match object, which I'll just usually store. I usually store them in a variable called mo. And match objects have a method called group, which will tell you the actual text. So I'm just going to print this out. And I'll just press F5 to run this. And you can see it prints out, it finds that first occurrence of this phone number pattern that we've made in the text that we're searching for right here. In fact, I don't really even need this message variable. I'll just get rid of that and paste the text there. This is a bit more obvious. And this is just three lines of code, just specifying the pattern, then telling it to search this string, and then printing out the results. That's a lot less code than that huge program that we had before. So it is totally worth it to learn regular expressions. Now, if we wanted to find every occurrence of that phone number pattern, we could just call the find all method instead. And that just returns a list of strings that match it. So we can just print out that list value right from the start. 
and this will find every occurrence of that phone number pattern in this string. So that's a huge time saving. We just have to first learn this regular expression syntax. I mean, right now we just know how to find uh, digit characters. So any numeric characters we know, well, slash D will find that. There isn't that much more to learn to it, but it'll cover the uh, next couple of lessons that we go over. So to recap, regular expressions are kind of like a mini language for specifying text patterns. Writing code to do pattern matching without regular expressions is a huge pain, so it's completely worth uh, the effort to learn regular expressions. Regex strings often use backslashes, so oftentimes we'll just use raw strings whenever we specify them. The regular expression functions for Python are in this RE module, and the re.compile function will create a regular expression object, calling this regular expressions objects search method will return a match object and that match object has a group method that will tell us the actual matching text and so this is the general pattern that we'd have calling compile then calling search then calling group but there's also a find all method that will just return a list of string matches and for right now, all that we know about the regular expression syntax is that slash d represents a digit numeric character. Welcome to lesson 23, which roughly covers pages 147 to 151 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. You can find this textbook online for free at automatetheboringstuff.com. In this lesson, we will be dealing with pattern matching and regular expressions. You may be familiar with searching for text by pressing Ctrl F and typing in the words that you're looking for. Regular expressions take this one step further. They allow you to specify a pattern of text to search for. Regular expressions are sort of a simplified mini language for specifying text patterns. One example of a text pattern is a phone number. If you live in the United States or Canada, you know that a phone number will be three digits for an area code followed by a dash followed by three more digits, followed by another dash, followed by four more digits. And this is how you, as a human, can know that this is a phone number, while this number is not a phone number. Most modern text editors and word processors, such as Microsoft Word or OpenOffice, have find and find replace features that can search based on regular expressions. Right here under the special menu, I can specify a pattern of text such as any digit or any letter. These are similar to what regular expressions are. Regular expressions are huge time savers. First, I'll show you an example that doesn't use regular expressions, and you'll see how much code it takes just to recognize simple patterns. I'll create a new file editor window, and let's write a function called isPhoneNumber that takes some text string as an argument, and it'll return true if text is an American or Canadian style phone number and false if it's not. So here's the code. First, we'll do a quick check just to see if it's 12 characters long. And if it's not, we can return false because we know that this is not phone number sized. And next, let's call is decimal on each character at the indexes 0 to 3. So I'll have a for loop going from 0 up to but not including 3, just so we get the first 3. And if text i is not uh, a decimal character, we can return false, because then we know that there's no area code. And also we have to check if the character at index 3 is not the dash. And if it's not, then we also return false there. And we'll have to check the next three characters after that to see if those are decimals, because that'll be you know, if we had a phone number, this will be the first three digits of the phone number that's not the area code. So we'll call isDecimal 
So if it's not a decimal numeric character, then we'll also return false. And then we'll check for that second dash at index three, or I'm sorry, at index seven. And if it's not equal to a dash, we'll also return false because it's missing that second dash. Then we'll have to loop over the characters from index eight up to, but not including 12, and check if those are decimal characters as well. So we'll call is decimal on each of those characters, eight to 11. And if, it's, if it returns false, then we want this to return false from our function because it's missing the last four digits. So if the execution manages to make it past all of these different checks, then we'll have our function return true. And I'll just save this as example.py. So we can run this program. Let's uh, first print out some uh, test results. So I'm going to call this function is phone number and I'll pass it the string 415-555-1234. And then I'll print out what the return value of is phone number is. So I'll press F5 and it returns true because this is in fact a phone number according to all of this code. But then if we change this to something like hello, then when we run this program, our is phone number function returns false. This is a lot of code and maybe you wanna write a function that takes a large string and finds where in that string there is a phone number. You'd have to write some more code that can make use of this function. It would be something like, uh, let's start off with a message. Say our string that we want to check is the string, call me at 415-555-1011 tomorrow, or at 415-555-9999 for my office line. And so if we wanted to detect where in this string these phone numbers are, if there are any uh, phone numbers in that string, we'd have to write code like this. Uh, we'll just set up a variable named found number to be equal to false. And we'll set this variable to true once we've found a number. And then we'll just loop through every character in this message. We'll create a substring and we'll store that in a variable named chunk. That is basically every 12 character long chunk from this big string uh, string in message. So we'll use a slice for this, everything starting at i. So i will just be the starting index and go up to i plus 12. And since it's a slice, we don't have to worry about it going past the end index like we would if this was just a regular uh, index access. So i plus 12. So when i is zero, it'll grab the first 12 characters, and then when i is 1, it'll grab these 12 characters, and then when i is 2, it'll grab the next uh, 12 characters, and so on and so on, until finally it's looking at this string. So we need something that will call is phone number and check if chunk contains a phone number. So if is phone number chunk, so if this returns true, then we want to print, oh, uh, phone number found. And we'll just set found number equals true. And then here at the very end, we'll check if found number is set to false. And if so, then we can print out a little message that says could not find any phone numbers. So we can run this by pressing F5. We can see this program has now found these phone numbers in this string. And remember, this string could be something huge, like we could just copy and paste all of the text from a web page and then put it in a multi-line string in our program and then just have it uh, go through that entire uh, large bit of text. But say there are no phone numbers, like we can get rid of the pattern but just by deleting a couple numbers here. And if we run this then, it'll just print out the message, could not find any phone numbers. So again, this is a lot of code. Um, you know, it, it uses all of the programming concepts that we're familiar with. You know, if 
you know, functions, the length function, uh, indexes and slices and everything like that. But this is still a lot of effort that we would have to put in. And text pattern recognition is done so often in programming that programmers have developed regular expressions in order to help uh, shorten all of this into just a few lines of code. So in fact, I'm going to write a version of this code using regular expressions, and you'll see just how much shorter it is. So first we'll import the RE module, which has all the regular expression functions in it. And then I'll just get rid of all of this. And now we just have to create a regular expression object that we'll store in this phone num regex variable. And this is returned by the re.compile function, which we just pass it our uh, regular expression string, which is basically the text that defines the pattern that we're looking for. So we'll be using our uh, raw strings for this. This is just a standard string that begins with the lowercase letter r. And this means that whenever we use the backslash in this string, we're not actually doing a, uh, an escape character like for new line characters or t. And that's because regular expressions use a lot of backslashes in them. So the pattern that we're looking for will be slash d, which says we're looking for a digit. And in fact, we're looking for three digits. So I'll just add three of these there. We're also looking for a dash, and then three more numeric digits, and then another dash, and then three more numeric digits. So this says, OK, we're creating, we're looking for this pattern of text. And we'll store this as a regular expression object that's returned by compile. We'll store that regular expression object in this variable. And the regular expression data type has a search method, which we can then use to search a string, like this string, for this pattern. And this will return a match object, which I'll just usually store. I usually store them in a variable called mo. And match objects have a method called group, which will tell you the actual text. So I'm just going to print this out. And I'll just press F5 to run this. And you can see it prints out, it finds that first occurrence of this phone number pattern that we've made in the text that we're searching for right here. In fact, I don't really even need this message variable. I'll just get rid of that and paste the text there. This is a bit more obvious. And this is just three lines of code, just specifying the pattern, then telling it to search this string, and then printing out the results. That's a lot less code than that huge program that we had before. So it is totally worth it to learn regular expressions. Now, if we wanted to find every occurrence of that phone number pattern, we could just call the findAll method instead. And that just returns a list of strings that match it. So we can just print out that list value right from the start. And this will find every occurrence of that phone number pattern in this string. So that's a huge time saving. We just have to first learn this regular expression syntax. I mean, right now we just know how to find uh, digit characters. So any numeric characters we know, well, slash D will find that. There isn't that much more to learn to it, but it'll cover the uh, next couple of lessons that we go over. So to recap, regular expressions are kind of like a mini language for specifying text patterns. Writing code to do pattern matching without regular expressions is a huge pain, so it's completely worth uh, the effort to learn regular expressions. Regex strings often use backslashes, so oftentimes we'll just use raw strings whenever we specify them. The regular expression functions for Python are in this RE module, and the re.compile function will create a regular expression object, calling this regular expressions objects search method will return a match object and that match object has a group method that will tell us the actual matching text and so this is the general pattern that we'd have calling compile then calling search then calling group but there's also a find all method that will just return a list of string matches and for right now, all that we know about the regular expression syntax is that slash d represents a digit numeric character. 
Welcome to lesson 24, which roughly covers pages 151 to 154 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that you know the basic steps for creating and finding regular expression objects with Python, you're ready to try some of the more powerful pattern matching capabilities. Say you wanted to separate the area code from the rest of a phone number. The string we used for the regular expression pattern for a phone number was slash d slash d slash d for the area code, followed by a dash, followed by the first three digits, followed by another dash, and then four more digits. So let's use this regular expression to find uh, phone numbers. First we're going to have to import the re module. We'll have to create a regex object, which I'll store in this phone num regex variable. So we create regex objects by calling compile, and then passing it that string of the regular expression pattern that we're looking for. And we use the method of that regular expression object called search to search a string for this pattern. So let's say the string was my number is 415-555-4242. And this will return a match object. So we want to be sure to store that in a variable. And the match object has a group method which will return the entire pattern. But say we just wanted to get the area code or just the phone number part from this. And we can do this using parentheses to mark out groups. So we can use a parenthesis here to mark these first three digits as the area code group, and then use parentheses here to mark out the rest of the phone number as a separate group also. So this also creates a regular expression object. And similarly, we can just use the search method to return a match object. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. And when we call mo.group, it does the same thing as before. But now we also have these separate individual groups. This first one will be group 1 for the area code. So we can just pass an integer 1 to that group method, and then it'll return just that first part, just these first three digits, which were right here. Note that it's, it doesn't need to actually match a literal parenthesis inside the text that we're looking at right here. And then the second group is the second set of parentheses right here, which are around the uh, main phone number part without the area code. So we can just pass 2 to the group method to get that part. So this is really handy syntax to put things inside groups when you just need to grab just a specific part of something. So parentheses have a special meaning in regular expressions. They mark out where the group begins and ends. But if you actually wanted to find literal parentheses in your text, say if we had the string uh, my number is and then the area code had parentheses around it, we would want to find literally parentheses as part of the text in our pattern. In this case, you need to escape the opening and closing parentheses characters with a backslash. So our regular expression string would look something like r and then backslash open parentheses since we're literally looking for a parentheses. This is not the start of a group slash d slash d slash d for three digits, and then a slash closing parenthesis, and then space slash d slash d slash d for the first three digits, and then the last four digits. So now when we call the search method, oh, that actually won't find anything. But if we call the search method, it can actually look up and find actual literal parentheses that are in the text string that we're searching. The vertical bar key above the enter key on your keyboard is called the pipe character. You can also use pipes to match one of several patterns as part of your regular expression. For example, say you wanted to match any of the strings Batman, Batmobile, Batcopter, or Batbat. -Bat. Since all of these strings start with bat, it would be nice if you could just specify that prefix once. Uh, this can be done with pipes. Let's create a new bat regex object by calling re.compile. This will be a raw string that we pass it. So the pattern that we're looking for is bat, followed by a bunch of possible suffixes. And so we'll put that in their own group right there. So we'll just type out all the possible suffixes that we're looking for, and we'll separate them with the pipe character. So it could be batman, or batmobile, or copter, or bat. 
now we can search a bit of text using this regular expression object and call its search method. Say we'll search the string Batmobile lost a wheel. And you can see it's successfully found the word Batmobile because that is one of the patterns that it's looking for. You know, if we were searching for something like Bat motorcycle, that wouldn't be found anywhere, and the search method would return the value none. This is an important thing to keep in mind. If the search method can't find that regular expression pattern in the string that you pass it, it's going to return none. So if you blindly just save that to the mo variable and then try to call group on that none value, you're going to get an error message because the none value doesn't have a method called group. And remember, since we've put this, all these possible suffixes into a group, and if we just want to find out which suffix it was that was found in this pattern, then we can just pass one to the group method. To recap, groups are created in regular expression strings with parentheses. The first set of parentheses will mark group one, the second um, set of parentheses will mark group two, and so on. So calling group or group zero returns the full matching string, whereas calling group one returns just the first group's matching string, and calling group two returns the second group's matching string, and so on. If you need to find actual literal parentheses in the string, then you can use slash opening parenthesis and slash close parenthesis in the regular expression string. And the pipe character can be used to match one of many possible groups. Welcome to lesson 24, which roughly covers pages 151 to 154 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that you know the basic steps for creating and finding regular expression objects with Python, you're ready to try some of the more powerful pattern matching capabilities. Say you wanted to separate the area code from the rest of a phone number. The string we used for the regular expression pattern for a phone number was slash d slash d slash d for the area code, followed by a dash, followed by the first three digits, followed by another dash, and then four more digits. So let's use this regular expression to find uh, phone numbers. First we're going to have to import the RE module. We'll have to create a regex object, which I'll store in this phone num regex variable. So we create regex objects by calling compile, and then passing it that string of the regular expression pattern that we're looking for. And we use the method of that regular expression object called search to search a string for this pattern. So let's say the string was my number is 415-555-4242. And this will return a match object. So we want to be sure to store that in a variable. And the match object has a group method which will return the entire pattern. But say we just wanted to get the area code or just the phone number apart from this. We can do this using parentheses to mark out groups. So we can use a parenthesis here to mark these first three digits as the area code group, and then use parentheses here to mark out the rest of the phone number as a separate group also. So this also creates a regular expression object. And similarly, we can just use the search method to return a match object. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. And when we call mo.group, it does the same thing as before, but now we also have these separate individual groups. This first one will be group 1 for the area code, so we can just pass an integer 1 to that group method, and then it'll return just that first part, just these first three digits, which were right here. Note that it's, it doesn't need to actually match a literal parenthesis inside the text that we're looking at right here. And then the second group is the second set of parentheses right here, which are around the uh, main phone number part without the area code. So we can just pass 2 to the group method to get that part. So this is really handy syntax to put things inside groups when you just need to grab just a specific part of something. So parentheses have a special meaning in regular expressions. They mark out where the group begins and ends. But if you actually wanted to find literal parentheses, in your text, say if we had the string uh, my number is and then the area code had parentheses around it, 
we would want to find literally parentheses as part of the text in our pattern. In this case, you need to escape the opening and closing parentheses characters with a backslash. So our regular expression string would look something like r and then backslash open parenthesis, since we're literally looking for a parenthesis, this is not the start of a group, slash d slash d slash d for three digits, and then a slash closing parenthesis, and then space slash d slash d slash d for the first three digits, and then the last four digits. So now when we call the search method, oh, that actually won't find anything. If we call the search method, it can actually look up and find actual literal parentheses that are in the text string that we're searching. The vertical bar key above the enter key on your keyboard is called the pipe character. You can also use pipes to match one of several patterns as part of your regular expression. For example, say you wanted to match any of the strings Batman, Batmobile, Batcopter, or Batbat. Since all of these strings start with bat, it would be nice if you could just specify that prefix once. Uh, this can be done with pipes. Let's create a new bat regex object by calling re.compile. This will be a raw string that we pass it. So the pattern that we're looking for is bat, followed by a bunch of possible suffixes. And so we'll put that in their own group right there. So we'll just type out all the possible suffixes that we're looking for, and we'll separate them with the pipe character. So it could be batman or batmobile, or copter, or bat. So now we can search a bit of text using this regular expression object and call its search method. Say we'll search the string batmobile lost a wheel. And you can see it's successfully found the word batmobile because that is one of the patterns that it's looking for. You know, if we were searching for something like that motorcycle, that wouldn't be found anywhere, and the search method would return the value none. This is an important thing to keep in mind. If the search method can't find that regular expression pattern in the string that you pass it, it's going to return none. So if you blindly just save that to the mo variable and then try to call group on that none value, you're going to get an error message because the none value doesn't have a method called group. And remember, since we've put this, all these possible suffixes into a group, and if we just want to find out which suffix it was that was found in this pattern, then we can just pass one to the group method. To recap, groups are created in regular expression strings with parentheses. The first set of parentheses will mark group 1, the second um, set of parentheses will mark group 2, and so on. So calling group or group 0 returns the full matching string, whereas calling group 1 returns just the first group's matching string, and calling group 2 returns the second group's matching string, and so on. If you need to find actual literal parentheses in the string, then you can use slash opening parentheses and slash close parentheses in the regular expression string and the pipe character can be used to match one of many possible groups. Welcome to Lesson 25, which roughly covers pages 154 to 157 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The pipe character that we went over in last lesson lets you match one of many possible groups in a regular expression, but you may also want to match a certain number of repetitions of the group. You may want to match at least one or more appearances of the group, or you may want to match the group if it appears more than seven times, but less than ten times. In this lesson, you'll learn the regular expression syntax for matching a specific number of repetitions. So to start off with, I'm just going to import the RE regular expressions module. And let's begin with the first uh, character, the question mark character. This says match the preceding group uh, zero or one times. It's, it's an optional group. It can either appear once or not appear at all. So let's use some code. I'm going to use a Batman regular expression that I'll save in this bat regex variable. So I'll call compile so that I'll return a regular expression object. And the pattern I want this to match will either be Batman 
or that woman. But in this case, I could just make this a bit shorter by just saying, uh, adding a wo wo group and then a question mark after it. So this question mark says this group right here can appear in the in the text zero or one times in order to match this pattern. So if we call this regular expression objects search method and search a string like the adventures of Batman, we can see that this regular expression does indeed match this part of the string. It found, it found this pattern in this string. And we can see it matched Batman, but this will also match the adventures of Batwoman. Because the WO group here can appear one or zero times. It appears zero times here, and it appears once here. But if we had something like the adventures of Bat Whoa 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 Woman, that actually doesn't match the pattern at all because it can only appear uh, zero or one time. So the search method will return none to the uh, MO variable. Using the earlier phone number example, we can make a regular expression that looks for phone numbers that do or do not have an area code. That is, we can make the area code optional. So let's enter this into the interactive shell. I'm going to create a regular expression object by calling compile and store it in phone regex. And the pattern for phone numbers, we can use that slash D, which stands for any numeric digit. So we can have three digits for the area code, three digits for the first part of the phone number, and then the last four digits of the phone number. So this is the phone number regex that requires a phone number uh, to have an area code. So if I had a string, my phone number is 415, 555-1234, call me tomorrow. We'll just save that in the variable mo because it'll return a match object. We can see that this actually found the phone number with the area code, except this pattern, which requires the area code, won't be able to match anything if this string doesn't have the area code. So search returns none, so the mo variable will contain the none value. So instead, let's create a phone regular expression object that puts this area code into a group, and then we have the question mark to say this preceding group is optional. It can appear once or it can appear zero times. And then in this case, we can see that the search method does return a match object for this phone number and also returns a match object uh, for this phone number when it doesn't have an area code in front of it. And if you ever have to actually literally match a question mark uh, as part of your pattern, you can escape the question mark with a backslash in front of it. The asterisk character is usually called the star character in the context of regular expressions, and it means match zero or more times. So let's go back to that Batman regular expression example. Creating that regular expression. And before we had the question mark here, which meant that this wo could appear one or zero times. If we change that to a star, this means this can appear zero or more times. So basically any number of times. This will actually match the Adventures of Batman string. It'll also match the Adventures of Batwoman string. And since it can accept any number of this WO group, because the star means zero or more, we could say have several of that, and it would still match that string. And if you need to uh, match a literal star that appears uh, as part of the pattern, you can escape it with a backslash. So while the star character means match zero or more, the plus character means match one or more. So unlike the star, which doesn't require its group to appear in the match string, 
the group preceding a plus must appear at least once. It's not optional. So let's create another Batman regular expression object by calling compile. And let's say that that WO group is now required to appear one or more times. This means that matching the adventures of Batman string, it won't actually find that. This string returns, or this uh, function call will return none. However, the adventures of Batwoman will match it because this WO group here appears once. And then also in this example with Bat Whoa 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 Woman, that'll also match because that WO group can appear one or more times. And if you have to match a literal plus sign that appears in your pattern, you can escape it with a backslash. So let's have a quick example with that uh, escaping. Let's say I'm just going to create a regex object by calling compile. And the pattern that I'm looking for is a literal plus sign followed by a literal star or asterisk followed by a literal question mark. That would match a string that looks something like, uh, I learned about plus star question mark regex syntax. And those would actually match these characters. So if you literally want to match these characters that otherwise have a special meaning for regular expression strings, then you can just precede them with a backslash to escape them. In fact, we could even have something like putting this inside of a group and saying this has to appear one or more times by having a plus sign that means, oh, one or more times. And that would match a string that looks like this. So here, it means literally I want you to find a plus sign that appears in the string that I'm looking for. That's part of the text pattern. And this is more of a regular expression instruction saying match one or more of this preceding group in the uh, parentheses here. So as a quick recap, the question mark means zero or one, the star means zero or more, and the plus sign means one or more. But let's say if you wanted to match a specific number of repetitions of a group. We can do that in Python. I'm going to create a regular expression object that matches the string ha exactly three times. And we can do that with curly braces with the number three in between them. So if we call the search method here, we can search for he said ha 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 and we can see that this string is matched in the regular expression this is kind of a simple example you might think well couldn't we just have something like ha 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 and this would work too this would do the exact same thing as this but the nice part about this syntax is that you could have something like, say, if we wanted to match multiple phone numbers that either had or did not have the uh, area code in front. So that expression would look like this, where we have the optional area code. These are three digits and a dash, uh, which can appear zero or one times. And then we have the rest of the seven digits of the phone number. And then we could put all of that inside of a group and then just say, we want this phone number, we want to match three phone numbers in a row. Now that might look a little bit strange. Let's uh, say they are also, uh, they have a comma that they're separated by, except that comma is also optional. So we could put that inside of a group and then say that comma is optional. So then this phone number regex would match a string like, my numbers are 415, 555, 1234, 
five 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 forty two forty two and two one two five 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 zero 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 zero. A really complicated looking pattern like this could be matched by this regular expression where we're looking for three phone numbers in a row, which may or may not have the area code and may or may not have a comma following it that separates them. And remember, this pattern would match exactly three of this complicated pattern. Just like we could have passed a string that has three ha's literally typed out instead of using this curly brace syntax, we could have just gotten rid of this and instead copied and pasted this entire regular expression three times. But then at this point, it's getting kind of hard to read what exactly we mean from this regular expression. It just, we'd have to spend a lot of time kind of piecing together what this means. So the curly brace syntax really helps out on that front. Now let's say you wanted to match, instead of three, you wanted to match a range of possible repetitions. So anywhere between three and five, we can just add a comma and then a second number. So then this becomes a minimum and maximum number of repetitions. So we could have a string like, he said, ha ha ha, and that would match. We could also have four or five of these ha's as well, and that would match. If we had any more, well, this would still match, but it would only match these first five ha 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 ha's. And just like with slices, if you leave off this first number or second number, in this case, this is the same thing as saying zero to five, or if you had three and then a comma followed by no number, this is the same as saying three or more. So there's an unbounded uh, maximum. You can have any number of these as long as it's at least three. So let's do a little experiment here. I'm going to create a regular expression that matches anywhere between three and five digits. So. That slash D was the regular expression syntax, meaning any numeric digits. And say I wanted to match a string that had between three and five of them. So I was going to call it and have it search the string one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. You can see that what it matched right here was the first five digits. I mean, it would technically match these five digits. But Python's regular expressions start as soon as possible, as the earliest match they can find is the match that they'll return. And also notice, it could have matched these first three characters, or the first four characters. But instead, it matched the first five characters, and that's because by default, regular expressions in Python do greedy matches. This means that it tries to match the longest possible string that matches this pattern. So in an ambiguous situation like this string, where it could match any three, four, or five digits, regular expressions are going to match the maximum longest possible string. Now if you want it to do a non-greedy match, you can specify a question mark after that curly brace. So this question mark is different from the question mark that means zero or one. When it comes after a pattern like this, as opposed to directly after a group. This means basically do a non-greedy match. So let's create this regular expression and then search that same one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero string. And you can see this time it matched the smallest possible string. And this is a pattern that happens a lot in regular expression syntax. Uh, if you add a question mark, it'll do a non-greedy match, whereas without it, it'll just do a normal greedy match where it tries to match the longest possible string. To recap, the question mark matches a group zero or one times, the star matches a group zero or more times, the plus matches a group one or more times, and the curly braces can match a specific number of times. And if you put two numbers separated by a comma in between the curly braces, you can have a minimum and maximum number of times. You can also leave out the first or second number inside the curly braces so that you can say that there is no minimum or no maximum. 
Greedy matching matches the longest string possible, while non-greedy matching matches the shortest string possible. And putting a question mark after the curly braces makes it do a non-greedy match. By default, regular expression syntax uh, does a greedy match. Welcome to Lesson 25, which roughly covers pages 154 to 157 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The pipe character that we went over in last lesson lets you match one of many possible groups in a regular expression, but you may also want to match a certain number of repetitions of the group. You may want to match at least one or more appearances of the group, or you may want to match the group if it appears more than seven times, but less than ten times. In this lesson, you'll learn the regular expression syntax for matching a specific number of repetitions. So to start off with, I'm just going to import the RE regular expressions module. And let's begin with the first uh, character, the question mark character. This says match the preceding group uh, zero or one times. It's, it's an optional group. It can either appear once or not appear at all. So let's use some code. I'm going to use a Batman regular expression that I'll save in this bat regex variable. So I'll call compile, so that I'll return a regular expression object. And the pattern I want this to match will either be batman or batwoman. But in this case, I could just make this a bit shorter by just saying, uh, adding a wo wo group and then a question mark after it. So this question mark says this group right here can appear in the in the text zero or one times in order to match this pattern. So if we call this regular expression objects search method and search a string like the adventures of Batman, we can see that this regular expression does indeed match this part of the string. It found it found this pattern in this string. And we can see it matched Batman, but this will also match the adventures of Batwoman. Because the WO group here can appear one or zero times. It appears zero times here, and it appears once here. But if we had something like the adventures of Bat Whoa 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 Woman, that actually doesn't match the pattern at all because it can only appear. Uh, zero or one time, so the search method will return none to the uh, MO variable. Using the earlier phone number example, we can make a regular expression that looks for phone numbers that do or do not have an area code. That is, we can make the area code optional. So let's enter this into the interactive shell. I'm going to create a regular expression object by calling compile and store it in phone regex. And the pattern for phone numbers, we can use that slash D, which stands for any numeric digit. So we can have three digits for the area code, three digits for the first part of the phone number, and then the last four digits of the phone number. So this is the phone number regex that requires a phone number uh, to have an area code. So if I had a string, my phone number is 415, 555-1234, call me tomorrow. We'll just save that in the variable mo because it'll return a match object. We can see that this actually found the phone number with the area code, except this pattern, which requires the area code, won't be able to match anything if this string doesn't have the area code. So search returns none, so the mo variable will contain the none value. So instead, let's create a phone regular expression object that puts this area code into a group, and then we have the question mark to say this preceding group is optional. It can appear once or it can appear zero times. And then in this case, we can see that the search method does return a match object for this phone number, and also returns a match object uh, for this phone number when it doesn't have an area code in front of it. And if you ever have to actually literally match a question mark uh, as part of your pattern, you can escape the question mark with a backslash in front of it.
The asterisk character is usually called the star character in the context of regular expressions, and it means match zero or more times. So let's go back to that Batman regular expression example. Creating that regular expression. And before we had the question mark here, which meant that this WO could appear one or zero times. If we change that to a star, this means this can appear zero or more times. So basically any number of times. This will actually match the Adventures of Batman string. It'll also match the Adventures of Batwoman string. And since it can accept any number of this WO group, because the star means zero or more, we could say have several of that, and it would still match that string. And if you need to uh, match a literal star that appears uh, as part of the pattern, you can escape it with a backslash. So while the star character means match zero or more, the plus character means match one or more. So unlike the star, which doesn't require its group to appear in the match string, the group preceding a plus must appear at least once. It's not optional. So let's create another Batman regular expression object by calling compile. And let's say that that WO group is now required to appear one or more times. This means that matching the adventures of Batman string, it won't actually find that. This string returns, or this uh, function call will return none. However, the adventures of Batwoman will match it because this WO group here appears once. And then also in this example with bat wo 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 woman that'll also match because that WO group can appear one or more times. And if you have to match a literal plus sign that appears in your pattern, you can escape it with a backslash. So let's have a quick example with that uh, escaping. Let's say I'm just going to create a regex object by calling compile. And the pattern that I'm looking for is a literal plus sign followed by a literal star or asterisk followed by a literal question mark. That would match a string that looks something like, uh, I learned about plus star question mark regex syntax. And those that actually match these characters. So if you literally want to match these characters that otherwise have a special meaning for regular expression strings, then you can just precede them with a backslash to escape them. In fact, we could even have something like putting this inside of a group and saying this has to appear one or more times by having a plus sign that means, oh, one or more times. And that would match a string that looks like this. So here it means literally I want you to find a plus sign that appears in the string that I'm looking for. That's part of the text pattern. And this is more of a regular expression instruction saying match one or more of this preceding group in the uh, parentheses here. So as a quick recap, the question mark means zero or one, the star means zero or more, and the plus sign means one or more. But let's say if you wanted to match a specific number of repetitions of a group. We can do that in Python. I'm going to create a regular expression object that matches the string ha exactly three times. And we can do that with curly braces with the number three in between them. So if we call the search method here, we can search for, he said, ha, ha, ha. And we can see that this string is matched in the regular expression. This is kind of a simple example. You might think, well, couldn't we just have something like, 
ha ha ha, and this would work too, this would do the exact same thing as this. But the nice part about this syntax is that you could have something like, say, if we wanted to match multiple phone numbers, that either had or did not have the uh, area code in front. So that expression would look like this, where we have the optional area code. These are three digits and a dash, uh, which can appear zero or one times. And then we have the rest of the seven digits of the phone number. And then we could put all of that inside of a group and then just say we want this phone number we want to match three phone numbers in a row now that might look a little bit strange let's uh, say they are also uh, they have a comma that they're separated by except that comma is also optional so we could put that inside of a group and then say that comma is optional so then this phone number regex would match a string like my numbers are 415-555-1234-555-4242, and 212-555-0000. A really complicated looking pattern like this could be matched by this regular expression where we're looking for three phone numbers in a row, which may or may not have the area code and may or may not have a comma following it that separates them. And remember, this pattern would match exactly three of this complicated pattern. Just like we could have passed a string that has three ha's literally typed out, instead of using this curly brace syntax, we could have just gotten rid of this and instead copied and pasted this entire regular expression three times, but then at this point it's getting kind of hard to read what exactly we mean from this regular expression. It just We'd have to spend a lot of time kind of piecing together what this means. So the curly brace syntax really helps out on that front. Now let's say you wanted to match, instead of three, you wanted to match a range of possible repetitions. So anywhere between three and five, we can just add a comma and then a second number. So then this becomes a minimum and maximum number of repetitions. So we could have a string like, he said, ha ha ha, and that would match. We could also have four or five of these ha's as well, and that would match. If we had any more, well, this would still match, but it would only match these first five ha-ha-ha-ha's. And just like with slices, if you leave off this first number or second number, in this case, this is the same thing as saying zero to five. Or if you had three and then a comma followed by no number, this is the same as saying three or more. So there's an unbounded uh, maximum you can have any number of these as long as it's at least three. So let's do a little experiment here. I'm going to create a regular expression that matches anywhere between three and five digits. So that slash D was the regular expression syntax, meaning any numeric digits. Let's say I wanted to match a string that had between three and five of them. I was going to call it and have it search the string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. You can see that what it matched right here was the first five digits. I mean, it would technically match these five digits, but Python's regular expressions start as soon as possible, as the earliest match they can find is the match that they'll return. And also notice it could have matched these first three characters or the first four characters but instead it matched the first five characters. And that's because by default, regular expressions in Python do greedy matches. This means that it tries to match the longest possible string that matches this pattern. So in an ambiguous situation like this string, where it could match any three, four, or five digits, 
regular expressions are going to match the maximum longest possible string. Now if you want it to do a non-greedy match, you can specify a question mark after that curly brace. So this question mark is different from the question mark that means 0 or 1. When it comes after a pattern like this, as opposed to directly after a group, this means basically do a non-greedy match. So let's create this regular expression and then search that same 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0 string. You can see this time it matched the smallest possible string. And this is a pattern that happens a lot in regular expression syntax. Uh, if you add a question mark, it'll do a non-greedy match, whereas without it, it'll just do a normal greedy match where it tries to match the longest possible string. To recap, the question mark matches a group 0 or 1 times, the star matches a group 0 or more times, the plus matches a group 1 or more times, and the curly braces can match a specific number of times. And if you put two numbers separated by a comma in between the curly braces, you can have a minimum and maximum number of times. You can also leave out the first or second number inside the curly braces so that you can say that there is no ma minimum or no maximum. Greedy matching matches the longest string possible, while non-greedy matching matches the shortest string possible. And putting a question mark after the curly braces makes it do a non-greedy match. By default, regular expression syntax uh, does a greedy match. Welcome to lesson 26, which roughly covers pages 157 to 159 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the find all method for regular expression objects. So since we're doing more regular expression work, I'm just going to go ahead and start off by importing the RE module. So we're going to use uh, this in a lot of examples. We'll create a phone number regular expression by calling the RE compile function, pass in a raw string, uh, and we'll look for a phone number pattern. So we'll have three digits for the area code, followed by a dash, followed by three more digits, and then four digits. And so phone regex contains our regular expression object. So in previous lessons, we called the search method of the regular expression data type, and this would find the first match inside of a string that we searched. But what the find all method does is it allows us to search a string for all matches of this regular expression pattern. So let's say we had a whole bunch of text like this one example resume, and I wanted to find all of the phone numbers that were on the resume. I could just hit Control A to select all, and then Control C to copy. And then I'll store this inside of a multi-line string. So just begin that with triple quotes, and then paste it with Control V, and then end it with triple quotes. So all of that text is now inside this variable resume. So before we would call search just to search this text and it would return the match object for the very first match. You can see it's this 508 area code phone number, which is the very first one right here, but it wouldn't find the later matches. So that's what find all will allow us to do. It'll let us find all of the matches and we just pass it the string that, uh, of the text we wanted to search. So find all doesn't return a match object, in fact just returns a regular list value with regular string values inside of it. And these strings are the, are the text that match the pattern that we're looking for. But there's a slight subtlety with the find all method that you should be aware of. Here's that regular expression pattern that we made. If the regular expression string that you're looking at doesn't have any groups, that is, it doesn't have any parentheses marking off groups inside this regular expression string, then the find all method will just return a list of strings, and each string in that list is going to be the text that it found matching that pattern. However, let's do an example where we're creating a regular expression object, a regex object, that does have groups, 
in it, we're going to use one group for the area code and then one group for the main number. Now if we call the regular, the, I'm sorry, the find all method, pass it that resume string, instead of returning a list of strings, it actually returns a list of tuples and the tuples have strings. So each of these tuples is one of the matches inside the text. You can see here's the other phone number match. But this tuple has multiple string values in it, and each of these strings corresponds to the groups inside of the regular expression object. So it's important to keep this in mind when you're writing your code. There's a difference. Find all returns just a simple list of strings when its regular expression object doesn't have any parentheses, it doesn't have any groups, but if it does have groups in it, it will return a list of tuples of strings. You can notice that this actually doesn't have the dash that comes after the area code, and that's because there's no group that contains that. So if you wanted the entire string as well, we could just put that inside of its own. Oh, I'll have to create a brand new line of code here. We can put this in its own group just by putting parentheses around everything. And now when we call find all, it will return a list of tuples now with three strings in each tuple because we have three groups. You can tell when the group starts uh, by its opening parenthesis. So this group is group one. The next is this opening parenthesis, which is for group two. And then the next opening parenthesis going left to right is for group three. So we have full number, area code group, and main number group. You can see we have some overlap in the text that we're matching, but that's because we have groups inside of groups. This group is inside the main group. So that's all you have to keep in mind about find all. And remember, find all, unlike the search method, doesn't return a match object. It just returns a list of strings or a list of tuples of strings. Next, let's look at character classes. We already looked at one character class. This is the slash D syntax that we use in regular expressions. And so this is a character class, meaning uh, this represents any numeric digit 0 through 9. So if we created our own regex object by calling re.compile, we could either, if we were looking for a digit, we could either do slash D or using what we know about pipes and groups, we could have a group where we're searching for zero and then use a pipe that says we're looking for zero or one or two or three or four or five and all the way up. And so this regular expression does the same thing as just slash D, except that's a lot more to type. So slash D, this character class is a nice shortcut, but there are other character classes as well. And these are in table 7-1. So there's slash D, which just does any numeric digit character from 0 to 9. And then there's capital slash D, which is any character that's not a numeric digit. So slash lowercase d is numeric digits, and then slash capital D is everything else. And you see this pattern with the other character classes as well. So slash W is for any word character, so it's any letter or a numeric digit or the underscore character. This doesn't include things like punctuation marks or spaces. And then slash capital W is anything that's not a letter, digit, or underscore character. And then slash S is for space characters, so the space, the tab, and the newline character. And you also have a capital S for anything that's not a space, tab, or newline. So let's use these in an example. So there's a Christmas song called The Twelve Days of Christmas. We'll just put those lyrics as a string. I've copied it and now I'll just paste it here. You probably know the song where it goes 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping, 10 lords a leaping, etc, etc. So we'll just save that as a string inside the lyrics variable. And now let's say we wanted to pass this string and use regular expressions to identify every pattern where we have some number followed by some word so that we could figure out, oh, 12 drummers, 11 pipers, 10 lords. So let's create a regular expression for this Christmas song. So we'll call re.compile to create a regular expression. So we'll have to come up with this 
regular expression. So let's see, we're looking for digits, and it could be either two digits or one digit, so we'll just say slash d for the character class for digits, and then have a plus, meaning one or more digits. So that'll cover both of these cases. And then it's what follows is a space, so we could put a slash s for that space, or we could actually just put a space character in there. Slash s would also just match a tab or new line character. And we want exactly one space, and then we want word characters, so letters or numbers or anything, and in fact we want at least one or more. So we'll add this plus right here. So let's test this out and see if it actually can find every single occurrence of this pattern inside this lyric string. So we'll call find all, and then we'll pass it the lyrics, and this will return a list of strings of all the matches of that pattern. We can see right here we got 12 drummers, 11 pipers, 10 lords. Each of these strings is one or more digits, followed by a single space, followed by one or more word characters. You can see that in this 12 drummers example, the pattern only goes up to here because then it finds a space character, which is not a word character right here. So this slash w plus only goes as far until it reaches the first non-word character, which is this space. So all of these slash whatever letters are the shorthand character classes. You can actually make your own character classes. And the syntax for that will be when we create our regex object, we're calling re compile, passing it a raw string. The syntax for that will be two square brackets and then all the characters that we want to be inside of this character class are in between the square brackets right here. So say we wanted to create, uh, let's see, a pattern of regular expressions for just val letters. So I'll just say val regex. So we're looking for a, e, i, o, or u. Essentially, this character class is the same as having a regular expression that looks like this, where we have a and using the pipe for or, so a or e or i or o or u. Except you can see that this square brackets character class syntax is a lot shorter than this. Especially because we can actually even put in ranges in here by using a dash. So if we wanted all lowercase letters, we could just put a dash z. And Python will understand that this means, oh, any lowercase letter. Or maybe you just want the letters a through f. And then if you also wanted the capital letters as well, you can just add capital A dash capital F. We just want the vowels, and remember to also put the capitalized letters as well. Otherwise, the capital vowels wouldn't, wouldn't be recognized in this pattern. So we can now find all the vowels inside of a string. So we'll just use that regular expression objects find all method, and we'll just have it search through a string like Robocop eats baby food. And you can see this finds every single time that this regular expression met pattern is found in this string. So it basically picks out all of the vowels. So here are the two O's, or three O's rather, from Robocop, and then the E and the A from eats, and the A from baby, and then the OO for food. So we could change this. Let's say we wanted to have like a double val regular expression. So say we wanted to match this character class exactly two of those, so two vals in a row. Robocop eats baby food. This time the only matches it would find, because it's looking for not only just vals, but two of them in a row, the only matches it finds are this EA right here, and then the OO in food. But one really nice thing about character about making your own character classes is that here we have a val regular expression that finds all this all these val letters. But if you add a caret symbol at the very start of the character class, you can actually make a negative character class. So now so now this will match every character that isn't in this character class. So this basically means do the opposite. It matches everything that's not specified here. So this is kind of like a, instead of vowels, it's really just finding consonants. 
instead. So if we called find all on that same string, now we can see none of the vowels are inside this return string. It's all the consonants, but not only that, it's also the spaces and also the punctuation marks as well. So remember, this doesn't mean all the letters that aren't here. It means any character that's not in here. So that includes punctuation marks and numeric digits. To recap, the regex method findAll is passed a string and it returns all matches in it, not just the first match like the, uh, like the search method. If the regular expression doesn't have groups, findAll returns a list of strings. But if the regular expression does have groups, findAll will return a list of tuples of strings. Slash D is a shorthand character class that matches digits. Slash W matches word characters. And slash S matches white space characters like space, tab, and new line. And the uppercase shorthand characters, slash capital D, slash capital W, slash capital S, We'll match all the characters that are not digits, words, or spaces. You can make your own character classes with the square brackets. And adding a caret symbol to the front of the character class will make it a negative character class. So that matches everything that's not in between the square brackets. Welcome to Lesson 26, which roughly covers pages 157 to 159 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the find all method for regular expression objects. So since we're doing more regular expression work, I'm just going to go ahead and start off by importing the RE module. So we're going to use uh, this in a lot of examples. We'll create a phone number regular expression by calling the RE compile function, pass in a raw string, uh, and we'll look for a phone number pattern. So we'll have three digits for the area code, followed by a dash, followed by three more digits, and then four digits. And so phone regex contains our regular expression object. So in previous lessons, we called the search method of the regular expression data type, and this would find the first match inside of a string that we searched. But what the find all method does is it allows us to search a string for all matches of this regular expression pattern. So let's say we had a whole bunch of text like this one example resume and I wanted to find all of the phone numbers that were on the resume. I could just hit control A to select all and then control C to copy. And then I'll store this inside of a multi-line string. So just begin that with triple quotes, and then paste it with control V, and then end it with triple quotes. So all of that text is now inside this variable resume. So before we would call search just to search this text and it would return the match object for the very first match. You can see it's this 508 area code phone number, which is the very first one right here, but it wouldn't find the later matches. So that's what find all will allow us to do. It'll let us find all of the matches. And we just pass it the string that, uh, of the text we want it to search. So find all doesn't return a match object, in fact just returns a regular list value with regular string values inside of it. And these strings are the, are the text that match the pattern that we're looking for. But there's a slight subtlety with the find all method that you should be aware of. Here's that regular expression pattern that we made. If the regular expression string that you're looking at doesn't have any groups, that is, it doesn't have any parentheses marking off groups inside this regular expression string, then the find all method will just return a list of strings, and each string in that list is going to be the text that it found matching that pattern. However, let's do an example where we're creating a regular expression object, a regex object, that does have groups in it. We're going to use one group for the area code and then one group for the main number. Now if we call the regular, the, I'm sorry, the find all method, pass it that resume string, 
instead of returning a list of strings, it actually returns a list of tuples, and the tuples have strings. So each of these tuples is one of the matches inside the text. You can see here's the other phone number match. But this tuple has multiple string values in it, and each of these strings corresponds to the groups inside of the regular expression object. So it's important to keep this in mind when you're writing your code. There's a difference find all returns just a simple list of strings when its regular expression object doesn't have any parentheses, it doesn't have any groups, but if it does have groups in it, it will return a list of tuples of strings. You can notice that this actually doesn't have the dash that comes after the area code, and that's because there's no group that contains that. So if you wanted the entire string as well, we could just put that inside of its own. Oh, I'll have to create a brand new line of code here. We can put this in its own group just by putting parentheses around everything. And now when we call find all, it will return a list of tuples now with three strings in each tuple because we have three groups. You can tell when the group starts uh, by its opening parentheses. So this group is group one. The next is this opening parenthesis, which is for group two. And then the next opening parenthesis going left to right is for group three. So we have full number, area code group, and main number group. You can see we have some overlap in the text that we're matching, but that's because we have groups inside of groups. This group is inside the main group. So that's all you have to keep in mind about find all. And remember, find all, unlike the search method, doesn't return a match object. It just returns a list of strings or a list of tuples of strings. Next, let's look at character classes. We already looked at one character class. This is the slash D syntax that we use in regular expressions. And so this is a character class, meaning uh, this represents any numeric digit 0 through 9. So if we created our own regex object by calling re.compile, we could either, if we were looking for a digit, we could either do slash d, or using what we know about pipes and groups, we could have a group where we're searching for 0 and then use a pipe that says we're looking for 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 and all the way up. And so this regular expression does the same thing as just slash d, except that's a lot more to type. So slash d, this character class, is a nice shortcut. But there are other character classes as well, and these are in table 7-1. So there's slash d, which just does any numeric digit character from 0 to 9. And then there's capital slash d, which is any character that's not a numeric digit. So slash lowercase d is numeric digits, and then slash capital D is everything else. And you see this pattern with the other character classes as well. So slash W is for any word character, so it's any letter or a numeric digit or the underscore character. This doesn't include things like punctuation marks or spaces. And then slash capital W is anything that's not a letter, digit, or underscore character. And then slash s is for space characters, so the space, the tab, and the newline character. And you also have a capital S for anything that's not a space, tab, or newline. So let's use these in an example. So there's a Christmas song called The Twelve Days of Christmas. We'll just put those lyrics as a string. I've copied it, and now I'll just paste it here. You probably know the song where it goes 12 drummers drumming, 11 pipers piping, 10 lords a-leaping, etc., etc. So we'll just save that as a string inside the lyrics variable. And now let's say we wanted to pass this string and use regular expressions to identify every pattern where we have some number followed by some word so that we could figure out, oh, 12 drummers, 11 pipers, 10 lords. So let's create a regular expression for this Christmas song. So we'll call re.compile to create a regular expression. So we'll have to come up with this regular expression. So let's see, we're looking for digits, and it could be either two digits or one digit, so we'll just say slash d for the character class for digits, and then have a plus, meaning one or more digits. So that'll cover both of these cases. 
And then it's what follows is a space. So we could put a slash s for that space, or we could actually just put a space character in there. Slash s would also just match a tab or new line character. And we want exactly one space. And then we want word characters, so letters or numbers or anything. And in fact, we want at least one or more. So we'll add this plus right here. So let's test this out and see if it actually can find every single occurrence of this pattern inside this lyric string. So we'll call find all, and then we'll pass it the lyrics. And this will return a list of strings of all the matches of that pattern. We can see right here we got 12 drummers, 11 pipers, 10 lords. Each of these strings is one or more digits, followed by a single space, followed by one or more word characters. You can see that in this 12 drummers example, the pattern only goes up to here because then it finds a space character, which is not a word character right here. So this slash w plus only goes as far until it reaches the first non-word character, which is this space. So all of these slash whatever letters are the shorthand character classes. You can actually make your own character classes. And the syntax for that will be when we create our regex object, we're calling re compile, passing it a raw string. The syntax for that will be two square brackets, and then all the characters that we want to be inside of this character class are in between the square brackets right here. So say we wanted to create uh, let's see, a pattern of regular expressions for just val letters. So I'll just say val regex. So we're looking for a, e, i, o, or u. Essentially, this character class is the same as having a regular expression that looks like this, where we have a and using the pipe for or. So a or e or i or o or u. Except you can see that this square brackets character class syntax is a lot shorter than this. Especially because we can actually even put in ranges in here by using a dash. So if we wanted all lowercase letters, we could just put a dash z. And Python will understand that this means, oh, any lowercase letter. Or maybe you just want the letters a through f. And then if you also wanted the capital letters as well, you can just add capital A dash capital F. We just want the vowels, and remember to also put the capitalized letters as well. Otherwise, the capital vowels wouldn't, wouldn't be recognized in this pattern. So we can now find all the vowels inside of a string. So we'll just use that regular expression objects find all method, and we'll just have it search through a string like Robocop eats baby food. And you can see this finds every single time that this regular expression met pattern is found in this string. So it basically picks out all of the vowels. So here are the two O's, or three O's rather, from Robocop, and then the E and the A from Eats, and the A from Baby, and then the OO for Food. So we could change this. Let's say we wanted to have like a double vowel regular expression. So say we wanted to match this character class exactly two of those, so two vowels in a row. Robocop eats baby food. This time the only matches it would find, because it's looking for not only just vowels, but two of them in a row, the only matches it finds are this EA right here, and then the OO in food. But one really nice thing about character about making your own character classes is that here we have a val regular expression that finds all this all these val letters. But if you add a caret symbol at the very start of the character class, you can actually make a negative character class. So now, so now this will match every character that isn't in this character class. So this basically means do the opposite. It matches everything that's not specified here. So this is kind of like a, instead of vowels, it's really just finding consonants instead. So if we called find all on that same string, now we can see none of the vowels are inside this return string. It's all the consonants, but not only that, it's also the spaces, 
and also the punctuation marks as well. So remember, this doesn't mean all the letters that aren't here. It means any character that's not in here. So that includes punctuation marks and numeric digits. To recap, the regex method find all is passed a string and it returns all matches in it, not just the first match like the, uh, like the search method. If the regular expression doesn't have groups, find all returns a list of strings. But if the regular expression does have groups, find all will return a list of tuples of strings. Slash D is a shorthand character class that matches digits. Slash W matches word characters and slash S matches white space characters like space, tab, and new line. And the uppercase shorthand characters slash capital D slash capital W slash capital S will match all the characters that are not digits, words, or spaces. You can make your own character classes with the square brackets. And adding a caret symbol to the front of the character class will make it a negative character class, so that matches everything that's not in between the square brackets. Welcome to Lesson 27, which roughly covers pages 159 to 163 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So in the last lesson, you learned about how you can use a caret to make negative character classes. You can also use the caret symbol at the start of a regular expression to indicate that the match has to occur at the beginning of the searched text. And likewise, you can put a dollar sign at the end of the regular expression to indicate that the string has to match at the end with this regular expression pattern. I'll show you what I mean. Let's go ahead and import the RE module so that we have access to all the regular expression functions. And I'll create a regular expression object where it has to begin with the word hello. So we'll call re.compile to create a regular expression object, we'll pass it a raw string, and we'll have a caret at the very beginning, and then type hello. So this means not only does this pattern have to have capital H and then LO, we're not only looking for this text pattern here, but this text pattern has to occur at the very beginning of the string, or else it doesn't count. If it sees hello in the middle of the string, that's not considered a match. So begins with hello regular expression. We'll just call the search method and we'll have it search the text. Hello there. And this indicates that it did find a match. It returns a match object. However, if we tried calling search and we're looking for the string, he said hello this would return uh, the none value because even though we have this text appearing here, it doesn't begin at the very start of the string, which is what this char char character says. So instead of returning a match object, this just returns the none value. Similarly, we could have something that has the dollar sign at the end of the string to say that this pattern has to be found at the very end of the string. That's what this dollar sign character means. So if we use this regex object to search the string, hello world, this would be a match because this world text, because this world pattern is found inside the string and also at the very end. However, we had some other random text there, then this search method call would return the none value. It didn't find this pattern. And you can use both of these to indicate that the regex pattern has to be not only just inside the text that you're searching, but it has to be the entire text. So let's create a regular expression called all digits. We'll store it in a variable called all digits uh, regex. And so the pattern We'll start it with a caret symbol, so it says the entire text has to begin with this pattern. We'll just say slash d, and then one or more. So this is a shorthand character class, meaning a numeric digit character. And this means that the pattern is one or more of these numeric digit characters. And we'll have a dollar sign at the end of it, saying that the string that we're searching also has to end with this pattern. So if we tried searching some string like this huge number right here, then that would be a match. The entire string has to match because it has to both begin and end with this pattern. However, we had something like had the lowercase letter x, that would split this up. 
and that would return none because it does not match the pattern. So if you think about it, this slash D plus means one or more digits. And so, you know, this string right here, it does begin with this pattern, because right here, it begins with one or more digits, and it also ends with this pattern, one or more digits. But having both of these means that the entire string has to both begin and end with just this pattern. So this string does not fit that criteria because it has a non-digit character. And that's why this returns none. Next, let's talk about the wildcard dot character. So while shorthand character classes like slash D, which stands for numeric digits, or slash W, which stands for word characters like letters or numbers, uh, those are nice for having a text pattern that says, you know, this range of characters. But having a period or a dot in your regular expression syntax, this stands for any character except for the new line. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's create a regular expression object that I'll store in this variable at regex. So we call re.compile to create the regular expression object. And I'll have a dot character, meaning that it can have any single character here and then the letters AT. So the pattern is anything followed by AT. So I could do a find all on a string that was something like the cat in the hat sat on the flat mat. And so this is find all, there's no groups here, so it just returns a list of strings, and each of these strings are a match. You can see cat here, the dot, which means anything. In this case, it's matching a C for hat, the dot character that means anything in this case matches an H. And you see that with all of these. Notice here, flat isn't the word that's matched because the dot character is only looking for a single character. And that's why it's just lat. We could try changing that. Let's uh, just copy this. And let's say it's a dot character and it could be, I don't know, one or two of those characters. So basically, the letters AT that are just preceded by one or two characters of anything. And if we tried calling find all on that, well, you can see it's probably not what you were expecting because now it's finding two characters that can be anything, and that includes white space characters. So we have a space and a C, a space and an H. We do have this F and L character. So when I say dot means anything except the new line, I do mean any character. So a common thing that's done is the dot star pattern in regular expressions. And so this combination, if you remember, dot means any character at all, and the star means zero or more. So this dot star syntax basically means anything, any pattern whatsoever. And this can be really useful at times. I'll give an example. Uh, let's create name regex equals re compile. And, well, first, here, I'll just copy that for later. First, let's say we had some string value that looks something like this. First name, Al, last name, Swigert. And so we had text like this, and we wanted to pull out the first name and also the last name. This would be kind of hard. I mean, I guess we could have some code like, I don't know, uh, find that maybe that first semicolon and I would give you the index 10 so maybe uh, plus uh, 2 which would be 12 and then we could use that information to later you know to get a slice so it starts off it cuts it starts off with the first name and it cuts off this label and, and we could find some more code like maybe have find for that last name part and then do some more index math and get the right indexes so that we can use slices to pull out these individual strings right here, but that's kind of a pain. Instead, let's create a regular expression that does that for us using dot star. So call re compile. So in this case, what we're looking for is that first name text. That's always going to be static right there, and then followed by a space. And then we can create a group that has dot star in it followed by another space, we're going to have last name, followed by a space, and then dot star inside of, a, of the second group. 
So I'm going to copy that. And now if we call if we call find all and pass it that string that we were looking at. Remember for find all, this is a regular expression that does contain groups, so it's going to return a list of tuples of strings. Each tuple are going to be the matches, but it's only going to find one match right here. And inside that one tuple are going to be one string for each of the groups. And so this, basically saying whatever, is going to be the string of the first, uh, the text of the first string, and then this part will be whatever for the, la the second string. So what this regular expression object is basically saying is, okay, look for the text first name colon space, and then whatever you find after that, that'll be the first name going up to this next part, this last name part in the string. So we're going to be looking at last name colon, and then whatever comes after that. And so this makes it really easy just by specifying the pattern, then doing all these calls to dot find and all the list slicing and everything else. Here you can just do it in two lines of code and you get the text that you want. Now one thing to keep in mind is that dot star uses greedy mode. It will always try to match as much text as possible. So to use it in a non-greedy fashion, you'll want to have dot star question mark. This is kind of how you, this is kind of like putting the question mark after that curly brace syntax when we want to have a non-greedy match. Let's say we're going to have the string angle bracket to serve humans close angle bracket for dinner close angle bracket. So this is the text that we're going to start searching. Now let's create a non-greedy regular expression and the pattern for this is going to be opening angle bracket, and then dot star, we'll make this a group, dot star question mark, and then close angle bracket. So now when we call find all for that string that we're going to search, this is going to return a string or a list with a string to serve humans. That's because it's saying just do a non-greedy match. We're looking for anything as long as it we have the uh, opening angle bracket and then the close bracket. But in between that can be anything, but you know, as little anything as possible. So Python will just start saying, hey, here's the opening angle bracket. Then we're just going to match anything until we see a close angle bracket. We're just going to do this as a non-greedy matching. So here's the first none, here's the first close bracket. We're just going to stop right there because we're not greedy. But if we create a greedy version of this, opening angle bracket, and then just dot star, which will do a greedy match, and we search this string, now you'll find it actually says, hey, okay, here's that opening angle bracket. Okay, so good so far. Then we'll find anything. And then it'll notice, hey, we can actually match even more text if we go past this first close, bank, uh, close bracket. This is also a close bracket, so we could fulfill, we could match that pattern by just matching everything here. And so that's how you, and that's how you get the string to serve humans for dinner. So before when I was talking about the dot syntax, you remember I said that this matches any character except for the new line character. Let's say we have a string that's Robocop's three prime directives. And those are serve the public trust. We'll have a new line, protect the innocent. And then another new line, and the third prime directive, uphold the law. So if we tried printing this out, you can see these new lines would cause this text to be split across multiple lines. So if we had some dot star regular expression, you can see it's just dot star. We'll make this a greedy one. So even if we search this text with the prime directives on it, you'll notice it only matches up to that first new line because this means, okay, match whatever character except for new line and zero or more occurrences of that. And since this is greedy, it'll match as much as possible. So basically, it'll match until it reaches a new line, because the dot can be any character except for a new line. So once it hits this new line character right here, then it says, okay, that's the first match that we've found. But there is a way to get the dot to mean 
every character, like truly every character, including new lines. And that is by passing a second argument to the compile function, and it'll be the re dot dot all variable. So this is just a little configuration thing that you can pass to the compile function. This says, okay, in this regular expression, dots here truly mean everything, including new lines. So now if we try to search that prime directive string, that dot means everything, so this truly means match everything, and also as much as possible, because it's a greedy match. So you can see here, it now matches the entire string. So having this second argument to the compile function is pretty useful. There's also another one where you can have it do a case-insensitive regular expression match. So let's do that val regular expression example that we had in the last lesson. I'm going to create a regular expression object for all the val characters, so a, e, i, o, and u. And let's say I forget to add the capital vals, capital a, e, i, o, u. Let's say I forgot to add that to my character class. Now if I'm searching a string that's something like al, why is your programming book talk about Robocop so much? Oh whoops, I actually want to do find all. You can see it's returned all the vowels, but it's only returning the lowercase vowels because that's what I told it to do technically. So this capital A doesn't actually appear. But I can have Python do a case insensitive matching. I can tell it to ignore all casing when I'm creating a regular expression by passing it re ignore case. Or just for short, you can also pass re.i. And this makes it say, okay, whenever you have a lowercase or uppercase character, whatever, it doesn't matter, this will match both. So this means matching a lowercase a or an uppercase a match a lowercase e or an uppercase e. Now when we do this same exact code, you can see the capital vowels are also included in the matched text. So to recap, the caret character at the beginning of the regular expression string means that the text it's matching has to begin with this pattern, and the dollar sign at the end means that the text has to end with that pattern. And if you use both, that means the entire string must match the pattern. The dot character is a wildcard character. It matches anything except new lines. But you can also pass re dot dot all as the second argument to the compile function to make the dots truly match new lines as well. Or you can pass re dot capital I as the second argument to compile and make the matching case insensitive. And when you combine the dot character with the asterisk or star character, you form the dot star which is a common way of saying match anything at all, because the dot is anything, and the star means zero or more of, the, of those anything characters. Welcome to Lesson 27, which roughly covers pages 159 to 163 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So in the last lesson, you learned about how you can use a caret to make negative character classes. You can also use the caret symbol at the start of a regular expression to indicate that the match has to occur at the beginning of the searched text. And likewise, you can put a dollar sign at the end of the regular expression to indicate that the string has to match at the end with this regular expression pattern. I'll show you what I mean. Let's go ahead and import the RE module so that we have access to all the regular expression functions. And I'll create a regular expression object where it has to begin with the word hello. So we'll call re.compile to create a regular expression object, we'll pass it a raw string, and we'll have a caret at the very beginning, and then type hello. So this means not only does this pattern have to have capital H and then LO, we're not only looking for this text pattern here, but this text pattern has to occur at the very beginning of the string or else it doesn't count. If it sees hello in the middle of the string, that's not considered a match. So, begins with hello regular expression, we'll just call the search method, and we'll have it search the text, hello there. And this indicates that it did find a match, it returns a match object. However, if we tried calling search, and we're looking for the string, he said hello, this would return uh, the none value, because even though we have this text appearing here, 
it doesn't begin at the very start of the string, which is what this char char character says. So instead of returning a match object, this just returns the none value. Similarly, we could have something that has the dollar sign at the end of the string to say that this pattern has to be found at the very end of the string. That's what this dollar sign character means. So if we use this regex object to search the string hello world, this would be a match because this world text, because this world pattern is found inside the string and also at the very end. However, we had some other random text there, then this search method call would return the none value. It didn't find this pattern. And you can use both of these to indicate that the regex pattern has to be not only just inside the text that you're searching, but it has to be the entire text. So let's create a regular expression called all digits. We'll store it in a variable called all digits uh, regex. And so the pattern, we'll start it with a caret symbol, so it says the entire text has to begin with this pattern. We'll just say slash d, and then one or more. So this is a shorthand character class, meaning a numeric digit character. And this means that the pattern is one or more of these numeric digit characters. And we'll have a dollar sign at the end of it, saying that the string that we're searching also has to end with this pattern. So if we tried searching some string like this huge number right here, then that would be a match. The entire string has to match because it has to both begin and end with this pattern. However, we had something like, had the lowercase letter x, that would split this up. And that would return none because it does not match the pattern. So if you think about it, this slash d plus means one or more digits. And so, you know, this string right here, it does begin with this pattern, because right here, it begins with one or more digits, and it also ends with this pattern, one or more digits. But having both of these means that the entire string has to both begin and end with just this pattern. So this string does not fit that criteria because it has a non-digit character. And that's why this returns none. Next, let's talk about the wildcard dot character. So while shorthand character classes like slash D, which stands for numeric digits, or slash W, which stands for word characters like letters or numbers, uh, those are nice for having a text pattern that says, you know, this range of characters. But having a period or a dot in your regular expression syntax, this stands for any character except for the new line. So I'll show you what I mean. Let's create a regular expression object that I'll store in this variable at regex. So we call re.compile to create the regular expression object. And I'll have a dot character, meaning that it can have any single character here. And then the letters at. So the pattern is anything followed by at. So I could do a find all on a string that was something like the cat in the hat sat on the flat mat. And so this is find all, there's no groups here, so it just returns a list of strings, and each of these strings are a match. You can see cat here, the dot, which means anything. In this case, it's matching a C. For hat, the dot character that means anything, in this case, matches an H. And you see that with all of these. Notice here, flat isn't the word that's matched, because the dot character is only looking for a single character. And that's why it's just lat. We try changing that. Let's uh, just copy this. And let's say it's a dot character, and it could be, I don't know, one or two of those characters. So basically, the letters AT that are just preceded by one or two characters of anything. And if we tried calling find all on that, well, you can see it's probably not what you were expecting because now it's finding two characters that can be anything, and that includes white space characters. So we have a space and a C, a space and an H. We do have this F and L character. So when I say dot means anything except the new line, I do mean any character. 
So a common thing that's done is the dot star pattern in regular expressions. And so this combination, if you remember, dot means any character at all, and the star means zero or more. So this dot star syntax basically means anything, any pattern whatsoever. And this can be really useful at times. I'll give an example. Uh, let's create name regex equals re compile. And well, first, here, I'll just copy that for later. First, let's say we had some string value that looks something like this. First name, Al, last name, Swigert. And so we had text like this, and we wanted to pull out the first name and also the last name. This would be kind of hard. I mean, I guess we could have some code like, I don't know, uh, find that maybe that first semicolon and that would give you the index 10. So maybe uh, plus uh, two, which would be 12. And then we could use that information to later, you know, to get a slice. So it starts off, it cuts, it starts off with the first name and it cuts off this label. And we could find some more code, like maybe have find for that last name part and then do some more index math and get the right indexes so that we can use slices to pull out these individual strings right here. But that's kind of a pain. Instead, let's create a regular expression that does that for us using dot star. So call re compile. So in this case, what we're looking for is that first name text. That's always going to be static right there and then followed by a space. And then we can create a group that has dot star in it followed by another space, we're going to have last name, followed by a space, and then dot star inside of, a, of the second group. So I'm going to copy that. And now if we call, if we call find all, and pass it that string that we were looking at, remember for find all, this is a regular expression that does contain groups. So it's going to return a list of tuples of strings. Each tuple are going to be the matches, but it's only going to find one match right here. And inside that one tuple are going to be one string for each of the groups. And so this, basically saying whatever, is going to be the string of the first, uh, the text of the first string. And then this part will be whatever for the, la the second string. So what this regular expression object is basically saying is, okay, look for the text first name colon space, and then whatever you find after that, that'll be the first name going up to this next part, this last name part in the string. So we're going to be looking at last name colon, and then whatever comes after that. And so this makes it really easy just by specifying the pattern, then doing all these calls to dot find and all the list slicing and everything else. Here, you can just do it in two lines of code and you get the text that you want. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that dot star uses greedy mode. It will always try to match as much text as possible. So to use it in a non-greedy fashion, you want to have dot star question mark. This is kind of how you, this is kind of like putting the question mark after that curly brace syntax when we want to have a non-greedy match. Let's say we're going to have the string angle bracket to serve humans, close angle bracket, for dinner, close angle bracket. So this is the text that we're going to start searching. Now let's create a non-greedy regular expression. And the pattern for this is going to be opening angle bracket, and then dot star, we'll make this a group, dot star question mark, and then close angle bracket. So now when we call find all for that string that we're going to search, this is going to return a string or a list with the string to serve humans. That's because it's saying just do a non-greedy match. We're looking for anything as long as it we have the uh, opening angle bracket and then the close bracket. But in between that can be anything, but you know, as little anything as possible. So Python will just start saying, hey, here's the opening angle bracket. Then we're just going to match anything until we see a close angle bracket. We're just going to do this as a non-greedy matching. 
So here's the first none, here's the first close bracket. We're just gonna stop right there because we're not greedy. But if we create a greedy version of this, opening angle bracket, and then just dot star, which will do a greedy match. And we search this string. Now you'll find it actually says, hey, okay, here's that opening angle bracket. Okay, so good so far. Then we'll find anything. And then it'll notice, hey, we can actually match even more text if we go past this first close, bank, uh, close bracket. This is also a close bracket. So we could fulfill, we could match that pattern by just matching everything here. And so that's how you, and that's how you get the string to serve humans for dinner. So before when I was talking about the dot syntax, you remember I said that this matches any character except for the new line character. Let's say we have a string that's Robocop's three prime directives. And those are serve the public trust. We'll have a new line protect the innocent, and then another new line, and the third prime directive, uphold the law. So if we tried printing this out, you can see these new lines would cause this text to be split across multiple lines. So if we had some dot star regular expression, you can see it's just dot star, we'll make this a greedy one. So even if we search this text with the prime directives on it, you'll notice it only matches up to that first new line because this means, okay, match whatever character except for new line and zero or more occurrences of that. And since this is greedy, it'll match as much as possible. So basically it'll match until it reaches a new line because the dot can be any character except for a new line. So once it hits this new line character right here, then it says, okay, that's the first match that we've found. But there is a way to get the dot to mean every character, like truly every character, including new lines. And that is by passing a second argument to the compile function, and it'll be the re dot dot all variable. So this is just a little configuration thing that you can pass to the compile function. This says, okay, in this regular expression, dots here truly mean everything, including new lines. So now if we try to search that prime directive string, that dot means everything, so this truly means match everything, and also as much as possible because it's a greedy match. So you can see here, it now matches the entire string. So having this second argument to the compile function is pretty useful. There's also another one where you can have it do a case insensitive regular expression match. So let's do that val regular expression example that we had in the last lesson. I'm going to create a regular expression object for all the val characters, so A, E, I, O, and U. And let's say I forget to add the capital vals, capital A, E, I, O, U. Let's say I forgot to add that to my character class. Now if I'm searching a string and something like Al, why is your programming book talk about Robocop so much? Oh, whoops, I actually want to do find all. You can see it's returned all the vowels, but it's only returning the lowercase vowels because that's what I told it to do technically. So this capital A doesn't actually appear, but I can have Python do a case insensitive matching. I can tell it to ignore all casing when I'm creating a regular expression by passing it re ignore case. Or just for short, you can also pass re.i. And this makes it say, okay, whenever you have a lowercase or uppercase character, whatever, it doesn't matter, this will match both. So this means match in a lowercase a or an uppercase a, match a lowercase e or an uppercase e. Now when we do this same exact code, you can see the capital vowels are also included in the matched text. So to recap, the caret character at the beginning of the regular expression string means that the text it's matching has to begin with this pattern, and the dollar sign at the end means that the text has to end with that pattern. And if you use both, that means the entire string must match the pattern. The dot character is a wildcard character. It matches anything except new lines, but you can also pass re.all dot dot 
as the second argument to the compile function to make the dots truly match new lines as well. Or you can pass re dot capital I as the second argument to compile and make the matching case insensitive. And when you combine the dot character with the asterisk or star character, you form the dot star, which is a common way of saying match anything at all, because the dot is anything, and the star means zero or more of, the, of those anything characters. Welcome to lesson 28, which roughly covers pages 163 to 165 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In previous lessons, we called the re.compile function to create regular expression objects, and these objects had a search method for finding the first match in some text, and also a find all method for finding every match in some text. So these methods are kind of like the find feature in a word processor program. In fact, idle itself has one of those. You can hit control F and then do a find to find some text. However, word processor programs also have find and replace features where they not only find some text, but they can replace it with some other piece of text. Idle has this as well, where you just type what you want to find and then what you want to replace it with here. So you can do find and replace with regular expressions as well. I'll give you an example. First, let's go ahead and import the regular expression RE module, and I'm going to create a names regular expression object by calling compile, and this will be for secret agent names. So just like agent Mulder or agent Scully, that pattern of text will be the word agent and then whatever their name is. So it'll just be some word characters, uh, one or more of them. So that's our agent names regular expression object. So if we called find all and we're searching through some string like agent Alice gave the secret documents to agent Bob. This would find two occurrences of this pattern inside the string here for agent Alice. So we're matching one or more word characters until we find a non-word character, which will be this space. So that's why it stops at agent Alice. And then the second pattern is right here for agent Bob. So let's say this is a secret message and we want to classify this and redact some parts of it and we don't want to give out Agent Alice's and Agent Bob's names. So we already have a regular expression object that can find their names inside of a string. So now we want to do a find and replace and we can do that with the sub method which will do a substitution. So it's sort of instead of find and replace it's find and substitute. So we'll just call the sub method of regular expression objects. And this is the text that we want to do the substitutions in. And the first argument will actually be what we want to replace anytime we find a match. So anytime we have Agent Alice or Agent Bob, we'll just uh, substitute it with the actual word redacted. So the sub method will return this string, except with the substitutions made to it. So that's why it says redacted gave the secret documents to redacted. So now Agent Alice and Agent Bob's identities are safe. So the sub method will not only find all of the occurrences, all of the matches of this pattern inside the string that you pass it for the second argument, it'll also substitute this string that you pass for the first argument in that return string. But say the string that you want to substitute it with you want to actually use part of the original pattern. Like say instead of having redacted gave the secret document, say we want to have agent A. We're not going to give the full name, we just want to have a little bit of it. So we'll just say agent A instead of agent Alice. But in order to know that instead of putting redacted here, we have to basically convert agent Alice to agent A, we have to use part of the original text. And we can do that with a slash number syntax. And the numbers stand for groups in the original uh, regular expression pattern. So I'll show you what I mean. So first we're going to have to have something that can find the first letter of the agent's name. So that's pretty simple. That'll just be slash w, just some letter word character. And we'll put that in a group. And then the rest of the name will also just be slash w word characters. So uh, we'll just use star. So this will be zero or more word characters. So the name part that we're looking for is one word character here in group one inside these 
first set of parentheses, followed by zero or more other letter characters. So this is our new names regex value. Now, if I just do this exact same find all call with that exact same string as before, you can see that the matches find all since this has groups, it's only going to return that that group, not the entire match, but just the group. So this A comes from this A since this is the entire string and then group one in that is just A right here. And then this B comes from this match of the pattern where group one is just this B Bob. So let's copy this line of the previous sub call that we made, but instead of having redacted as what replaces the agent name, we actually want to replace it with agent then have a slash one, which means use the text from group one of the match for the substituted text. And then uh, we'll just add a few asterisks afterward. Oh, one thing to keep in mind though, we should use a raw string for this so that we want to have a literal backslash in this string. So when we run this code, it returns the string agent A, star, 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 gave the secret documents to agent B, star, 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 star. So you can see, here's the original reg regular expression pattern, where it matches agent, a letter character, followed by zero or more letter characters. So in this string, this text is a match, as well as this text. And that first letter character, that first word character, is inside of a group. It's group one. So in our substituted string, we're just going to have literally the word agent, and then have slash one, meaning uh, inside that match, whatever was that first letter. So in this match, that'll be this capital A. In this match, that'll be this capital B. If we had multiple groups inside our regular expression, then the first one would be slash one. The second set of parentheses would be slash two in the substituted string. The third group would be slash three and so on. So basically what this slash number syntax does is say in the substituted string, I want some part of the original matching string. So this is pretty powerful. We can now use regular expressions in a find and replace feature. Next, let's talk about verbose regular expression strings. So the regular expression strings, the strings that we pass to the compile function, can look kind of awkward, especially when they get really big. Remember that phone number regular expression example that we had where we would have something like slash d slash d slash d for the area code, followed by the first three numbers, then another dash, and then four more numbers. This regular expression can really get out of hand and start looking really complicated and be hard to read when we're looking back at our code two weeks later after we wrote it and thinking like, oh, what, what does this mean? Uh, it's three digits and blah, blah, blah. And you'd have comments and stuff, but that's, that's not gonna help too much. So there's another format called the verbose for format for when you call the re compile uh, function. So let's do our phone number example right here. So area code three digits, first three digits, last four digits. So in verbose mode, white space in this string doesn't reflect the actual pattern that we want it to match. So what this means is that we can use the triple quotes here to make this a multi-line string we could add new lines here, and these new lines aren't going to be a part of the pattern that we're looking for. So the text doesn't have to contain new lines in order to match this pattern. And this is great. This makes it a lot more readable because we can also add comments inside of this string when we're using verbose mode. So we can add a few spaces here, and remember, white space, This all these space characters aren't going to be a part of the actual pattern itself. We get to add a pound symbol. Remember, this is inside the string, so it's technically not a Python comment, but it uses the same syntax inside of this string. So we can say, you know, just mark this as area code, add a bunch of spaces here, say first dash, and so we can add comments as part of our regular expression, which really helps make this a lot more readable. Later on, when we're looking at this code, we can say, oh, right, I remember what all of these different parts of this giant regular expression stand for. And this is really helpful when we're coming up with really complicated patterns. So say we have a group right here. We're going to have area code without parens. We're going to have this be or.
matching an area code that actually does have parentheses around the three digits. So we'll have to escape this opening and close parentheses and have a space afterwards. And we could just make the comment say or area code with parentheses and no dash. So this helps let us add documentation to our really complicated looking regular expressions. Let's say later on if we had something like we wanted to also match an extension that comes right after this, we'd say, okay, there could also be a space followed by the letter X and maybe like two or more digits, two to four digits for an extension number. I can add a comment saying, this is the extension like X, one, two, three, four. And so we can have really complicated regular expression strings, except verbose mode helps us by allowing us to format it by adding spaces and comments that aren't actually going to be part of the regular expression pattern, but adding these spaces and comments really helps us make this code understandable. It helps make it readable. The last thing I'm going to cover is this second argument to the compile function. So in the last lesson, I talked about how you could pass ignore case or simply capital I, and this would make the regular expression ignore any case sensitivity issues uh, you could also pass dot all, which would make the dot character literally match everything, including the new line. But what if you wanted to use both ignore case and dot all? You can only pass one value for this second argument. So the way that the compile function solves this is with this kind of esoteric syntax where you would have ignore case and then have the bitwise or operator, which is just this vertical pipe character to combine all of the options that you want to pass. So if you wanted it to be ignore case and dot all and verbose mode, you could combine each of these with a bitwise or operator. So bitwise operators are kind of beyond the scope of this book and these aren't really used anywhere else. They're only used in this compile function. So this isn't a general Python thing that you can use with any function call that you make. It's really just for this second argument to the compile function. And it's a syntax that was used in older programming languages and Python just sort of copied it because other languages at the time were using it, but it's kind of old fashioned and sort of weird now. But this is sort of what we're left with. So if you ever wanted to use multiple of these options for the second argument, then just combine them with the bitwise or operator, this piped character. So to recap, the sub method will do substitutions with your regular expression objects. They will take some string and then anytime it finds the matching pattern, it will substitute that with some other string and return the string with all of these substitutions. You can also use the slash one, slash two, slash three syntax to substitute group one, two, and three, and so on from the regular expression pattern into the substituted string. You can also pass re.verbose to the compile function, and that lets you add white space and comments to the regular expression string that you're passing to the compile function. And this helps make the regular expression code a lot easier to read. And if you want to pass multiple arguments, such as dot all, ignore case, and verbose as the second argument to the uh, compile function, you can combine them all together with the vertical pipe bitwise or operator. Welcome to Lesson 28, which roughly covers pages 163 to 165 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In previous lessons, we called the re.compile function to create regular expression objects, and these objects had a search method for finding the first match in some text, and also a find all method for finding every match in some text. So these methods are kind of like the find feature in a word processor program. In fact, idle itself has one of those. You can hit control F and then do a find to find some text. However, word processor programs also have find and replace features where they not only find some text, but they can replace it with some other piece of text. Idle has this as well, where you just type what you want to find and then what you want to replace it with here. So you can do find and replace with regular expressions as well. I'll give you an example. First, let's go ahead and import the regular expression RE module. And I'm going to create a names regular expression object by calling compile. And this will be for secret agent names. So 
just like Agent Mulder or Agent Scully, that pattern of text will be the word agent and then whatever their name is. So it'll just be some word characters, uh, one or more of them. So that's our agent names regular expression object. So if we called find all and we're searching through some string like Agent Alice gave the secret documents to Agent Bob. This would find two occurrences of this pattern inside the string here for Agent Alice. So we're matching one or more word characters until we find a non-word character, which will be this space. So that's why it stops at Agent Alice. And then the second pattern is right here for Agent Bob. So let's say this is a secret message and we want to classify this and redact some parts of it and we don't want to give out Agent Alice's and Agent Bob's names. So we already have a regular expression object that can find their names inside of a string. So now we want to do a find and replace and we can do that with the sub method which will do a substitution. So it's sort of instead of find and replace it's find and substitute. So we'll just call the sub method of regular expression objects. And this is the text that we want to do the substitutions in. And the first argument will actually be what we want to replace anytime we find a match. So anytime we have Agent Alice or Agent Bob, we'll just uh, substitute it with the actual word redacted. So the sub method will return this string, except with the substitutions made to it. So that's why it says redacted gave the secret documents to redacted. So now Agent Alice and Agent Bob's identities are safe. So the sub method will not only find all of the occurrences, all of the matches of this pattern inside the string that you pass it for the second argument, it'll also substitute this string that you pass for the first argument in that return string. But say the string that you want to substitute it with, you want to actually use part of the original pattern. Like say instead of having redacted gave the secret document, say we want to have agent A. We're not going to give the full name, we just want to have a little bit of it. So we'll just say agent A instead of agent Alice. But in order to know that instead of putting redacted here, we have to basically convert agent Alice to agent A, we have to use part of the original text. And we can do that with a slash number syntax. And the numbers stand for groups in the original uh, regular expression pattern. So I'll show you what I mean. So first we're going to have to have something that can find the first letter of the agent's name. So that's pretty simple. I'll just be slash w, just some letter word character. And we'll put that in a group. And then the rest of the name will also just be slash w word characters. So uh, we'll just use star. So this will be zero or more word characters. So the name part that we're looking for is one word character here in group one inside these first set of parentheses, followed by zero or more other letter characters. So this is our new names regex value. Now if I just do this exact same find all call with that exact same string as before, you can see that the matches find all since this has groups, it's only going to return that, that group, not the entire match, but just the group. So this A comes from this A, since this is the entire string, and then group one in that is just A right here. And then this B comes from this match of the pattern, where group one is just this B, Bob. So let's copy this line of the previous sub call that we made, but instead of having redacted as what replaces the agent name, we actually want to replace it with agent, then have a slash one, which means use the text from group one of the match for the substituted text. And then uh, we'll just add a few asterisks afterward. Oh, one thing to keep in mind though, we should use a raw string for this so that we want to have a literal backslash in this string. So when we run this code, it returns the string agent A, star, 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 gave the secret documents to agent B, star, 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 star. So you can see, here's the original reg regular expression pattern, where it matches agent, a letter character, followed by zero or more letter characters. So in this string, this text is a match, as well as this text. And that first letter character, that first word character, is inside of a group. It's group one. So in our substituted string, 
We're just going to have literally the word agent, and then have slash one, meaning uh, inside that match, whatever was that first letter. So in this match, that'll be this capital A. In this match, that'll be this capital B. If we had multiple groups inside our regular expression, then the first one would be slash one, the second set of parentheses would be slash two in the substituted string, the third group would be slash three, and so on. So basically what this slash number syntax does is say in the substituted string, I want some part of the original matching string. So this is pretty powerful. We can now use regular expressions in a find and replace feature. Next, let's talk about verbose regular expression strings. So the regular expression strings, the strings that we pass to the compile function, can look kind of awkward, especially when they get really big. Remember that phone number regular expression example that we had where we would have something like slash d slash d slash d for the area code, followed by the first three numbers, then another dash, and then four more numbers. This regular expression can really get out of hand and start looking really complicated and be hard to read when we're looking back at our code two weeks later after we wrote it and thinking like, oh, what, what does this mean? Uh, it's three digits and blah, blah, blah. And you'd have comments and stuff, but that's, that's not going to help too much. So there's a, another format called the verbose for, format for when you call the re compile uh, function. So let's do our phone number example right here. So area code three digits, first three digits, last four digits. So in verbose mode, white space in this string doesn't reflect the actual pattern that we want it to match. So what this means is that we can use the triple quotes here to make this a multi-line string. We could add new lines here, and these new lines aren't going to be a part of the pattern that we're looking for. So the text doesn't have to contain new lines in order to match this pattern. And this is great. This makes it a lot more readable because we can also add comments inside of this string when we're using verbose mode. So we can add a few spaces here. And remember, white space, This all these space characters aren't going to be a part of the actual pattern itself. We get to add a pound symbol. And remember, this is inside the string, so it's technically not a Python comment but it uses the same syntax inside of this string. So we can say, you know, just mark this as area code, add a bunch of spaces here, say first dash. And so we can add comments as part of our regular expression, which really helps make this a lot more readable. Later on, when we're looking at this code, we can say, oh, right, I remember what all of these different parts of this giant regular expression stand for. This is really helpful when we're coming up with really complicated patterns. So say we have a group right here. We're going to have area code without parens. We're going to have this be or. Matching an area code that actually does have parentheses around the three digits. So we'll have to escape this opening and close parentheses and have a space afterwards. And we could just make the comment say or area code with parentheses and no dash. So this helps let us add documentation to our really complicated looking regular expressions. Say later on if we had something like we wanted to also match an extension that comes right after this, we'd say okay there could also be a space followed by the letter X and maybe like two or more digits, two to four digits for an extension number. You can add a comment saying this is the extension like X, one, two, three, four. And so we can have really complicated regular expression strings, except verbose mode helps us by allowing us to format it by adding spaces and comments that aren't actually going to be part of the regular expression pattern, but adding these spaces and comments really helps us make this code understandable. It helps make it readable. The last thing I'm going to cover is this second argument to the compile function. So in the last lesson, I talked about how you could pass ignore case or simply capital I, and this would make the regular expression ignore any case sensitivity issues. Uh, you could also pass dot all, which would make the dot character literally match everything, including the new line. 
But what if you wanted to use both ignore case and dot all? You can only pass one value for this second argument. So the way that the compile function solves this is with this kind of esoteric syntax where you would have ignore case and then have the bitwise or operator, which is just this vertical pipe character, to combine all of the options that you want to pass. So if you wanted it to be ignore case and dot all and verbose mode, you could combine each of these with a bitwise or operator. So bitwise operators are kind of beyond the scope of this book, and these aren't really used anywhere else. They're only used in this compile function. So this isn't a general Python thing that you can use with any function call that you make. It's really just for this second argument to the compile function. And it's a syntax that was used in older programming languages, and Python just sort of copied it because other languages at the time were using it, but it's kind of old-fashioned and sort of weird now. But this is sort of what we're left with. So if you ever wanted to use multiple of these options for the second argument, then just combine them with the bitwise or operator, this pipe character. So to recap, the sub method will do substitutions with your regular expression objects. They will take some string, and then anytime it finds the matching pattern, it will substitute that with some other string and return the string with all of these substitutions. You can also use the slash one, slash two, slash three syntax to substitute group one, two, and three, and so on from the regular expression pattern into the substituted string. You can also pass re.verbose to the compile function, and that lets you add white space and comments to the regular expression string that you're passing to the compile function. This helps make the regular expression code a lot easier to read. And if you want to pass multiple arguments, such as dot all, ignore case, and verbose as the second argument to the uh, compile function, you can combine them all together with the vertical pipe bitwise or operator. Welcome to lesson 29. In this lesson, we're going to create a program using all of our regular expression and previous programming knowledge. So say that your boss comes to you with a giant PDF file full of phone numbers and email addresses and says, I need you to copy and paste out every single phone number in this document. And this document is dozens of pages long. So if you had to do this on your own, just copying and pasting each of these lines over and over and over again, this would take you hours, especially if you had multiple documents like this. Instead, let's write a Python program that will do this for us. Now, it'll be a lot easier if we can just go to these documents, press Control A to select all, and then Control C to copy it, and then have our program just read this text off of the clipboard. So we'll be using the Piper Clip module for this program. So in a brand new editor window, let's just save this as phone and email.py. Since this will be a program that we run over and over again, we're going to start it off with a shebang line which tells Python which version of Python that we want to run this script. So I'm on Windows, so for me it'll look like Python 3. And next, let's create a series of to-do comments that will just sort of create a skeleton of what we want our program to do. So first we'll have to create a regex object for phone numbers. Then we'll have to create a regex object for email addresses. Next, we'll have to get the text off the clipboard. And then we'll have to extract the email addresses and phone numbers uh, from this text. And then we'll have to copy the extracted phone numbers and emails to the clipboard. So let's do this one at a time. So at the very top of our program, underneath the shebang line, we're going to have to figure out which modules we want to import. So since we'll be dealing with regular expressions, we'll have to import the RE module. And also since we'll be copying and, uh, and pasting text from the clipboard, we'll have to import the Piper Clip module as well. Now this Piper Clip module doesn't come with Python, so you'll have to install it separately. And there are instructions on doing this in the course notes. You'll just have to use the pip program to install it. So the regular expression objects are created by calling re.compile. 
and then we just pass it a string. It's usually a lot helpful to use a raw string because we have a lot of backslashes in these strings usually. And I want to use verbose mode for this, so I'm going to pass re verbose as the second argument. So this will allow me to use a triple quoted multi-line string and also all this white space and even the comments that I add inside of the regular expression string won't be a part of the actual pattern that it needs to match. This will make it a lot more readable. So let me think about the types of phone numbers that I want to uh, be able to collect. So the really basic type is just a three digit area code with the phone number separated by dashes, but that's not the only way that it could look. In fact, the area code could be completely optional and not even there, or the area code could be surrounded by parentheses, and instead of that first dash, just have a space instead. And then we could also have phone numbers that have extensions after them. So it could look like the word EXT followed by a number of digits. Let's say this will be anywhere between two and five digits long for the extension. Or that could look like EXT dot, or even just the letter X. So let me just write out some more comments inside this regular expression string. This will sort of be the skeleton of all the different parts of the regular expression I want to make. So we'll have this area code, which is optional. And then we'll have that first separator that comes after the area code. And we'll have the first three digits followed by another separator, followed by the last four digits, and then followed by an extension, which will also be optional. Let me just add some spaces here by highlighting them all and adding tabs. Okay, so the area code this is pretty simple. Could just be three digits, or it could be the parentheses, the three digits surrounded by parentheses. So I'm going to put this in a group. These parentheses will create this as its own separate group. So I'll say I'm looking for this group, or, which I use the vertical pipe character to mean or, or I'm looking for another group. And this one has literal parentheses, so I'm going to have to escape them with the backslash. So an opening parenthesis followed by three digits, followed by a literal closing parenthesis. And also, this entire area code could be optional, so I'm going to put it in its own group. And this group means you know, either this pattern or this pattern, and that group itself will be optional. I'll put the question mark right here that says, this entire group can appear in the pattern zero or one times. And after that, we'll just have the separator. Could either be a white space character like the space, so I'll just use the space uh, shorthand character class, or it could be a dash. I'll just put this in its own group as well. And next, we'll have the first three digits. This is pretty simple. We'll just have three digit characters that we're looking for, followed by another separator. We'll just say that this will be the dash in between the first three and last four characters, or uh, digits. We'll have the last four digits that we're looking for. And then we'll have an extension. Uh, so this is going to be a little complicated. Let's think. Could either be the word EXT followed optionally by a literal parenthesis. So I'm sorry, a literal period. So let's put that literal period that's been escaped with the backslash inside its own group and then put a question mark after that saying that this is optional. It could appear or it could not appear. And then we'll have a space character that follows it, followed by a certain number of digits. So we'll say, so we'll have a certain number of digits here. We put this in its own group. We'll say it could be two to five digits. So we'll use that curly brace, meaning that this pattern here for a single digit could appear two to five times. And of course, let's put all, all of this extension stuff. Oh, whoops, almost forgot about this format. So let's put all of this inside of a group. So the extension could look like that. Or actually, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna just separate this part out. The extension could look like this with ext followed optionally by a parenthesis, or followed optionally by a period, and then a space. Or it could just look like the letter x by itself. So I'll just put this as that word part of the extension. 
just say extension word part. And I'll just cut and paste this on the next line. This will be the extension, the number part. And it's also optional. And I'll need to put both of these parts inside of a group and make that group optional. So I'm going to have a opening parenthesis here, and then a close parenthesis here, and follow it up with a question mark so that this entire group will be optional. So this looks pretty complicated, right? But verbose mode allows us to add these comments and also these new lines and other space characters as part of the regular expression string without changing what the pattern is. So if we didn't have verbose mode, we'd have to use a single line string that would look like this. So this line of code is much harder to read and make sense of than this line of code. At least we have the comments here telling us what each of these parts are. So if we have to go back in and make changes to this code later, it'll be a lot easier to figure out what we meant by all of this code than if we just had this giant wall of text right here. So now that I'm done with this part uh, of creating a regular expression for phone numbers, I'll get rid of this to do. And I'll just leave this comment here. This will describe what this part of the code is doing. And of course, Compile will return a regular expression object, so we'll have to save that to a variable. Let's just say phone regex. Next, let's move on to create a regular expression for email addresses. So I'll just have something like phone regex equals re compile, have a multi line string, and use verbose mode for this compile function. So the actual regular expression for email addresses is really crazy because email addresses can have all sorts of things. We're used to seeing them as something at something.com, but this name part can also have periods in it, can have plus signs in it. I think it can even have percent and question marks in it, but let's just, um, we'll just handle just dots and plus signs. And we'll also have underscores as well. Those show up in email addresses too. This could be something like .edu or .gov or .net. And this domain name right here could also be using tons of weird characters in it. So we'll just use sort of the same pattern for this as we do for this. So let's just use comments to create a skeleton. First there'll be the name part. Then there'll be the at symbol, followed by the domain name part. So for the name part, we can't just use slash w, because we also need to include characters like this dot and the plus sign. And slash w is a character class just for letters, numbers, and the underscore. So instead, we'll have to create our own character class using the square brackets. So this character class will be able to match uh, lowercase letters and also uppercase letters and the digits 0 through 9. We also want it to match a underscore or a period character or a plus character. Remember, inside of a character class, in between these square brackets, we don't have to escape these dots and plus signs with backslashes. That's only something that we have to do outside of the square brackets in a character class, like what we did here with the parentheses, the literal parentheses that we wanted to match in the pattern. This is the range of characters that can be in this name part of the email address, and we'll be searching for one or more of them, so I'll put a plus sign after that. Next is the at symbol part. This is really easy. We'll say at symbol. And then the domain name part. We'll just go ahead and copy and paste this part and use that. Let's uh, get the text off of the clipboard. So here we can use the Piper Clips, uh, Piper Clip Modules paste function. And that will return the string of the text that's currently on the clipboard. So let's just save that into text. Next, we'll extract the email and phone numbers off of the, uh, the text. So here we'll use this phone regex object. It has a find all method. And we'll just pass it that text to, to check for uh, this phone regular expression pattern. And find all will return a list of strings for us with each string being a matched phone number. 
So I'll just save that in extracted phone as a variable. And we'll do the same thing for all the email addresses as well. We'll just use the email regular expression object here, and save that in, an, in a variable named extracted email. So we've added a lot of code, but we're not really sure if all of this works or not. So let's just temporarily add some print function calls and just print out what the values are inside these two variables. So I'm going to go and instead of selecting all with control A, I'm just going to grab some of the text here. Let's just say, let's just highlight just this amount and press control C to copy that to the clipboard. And then I'll run this program. So the extracted email seems to work. This is just a list of email address strings. That's exactly what we expected. But this it looks a little strange. It's not a list of strings, but actually a list of tuples. And inside the tuples, there are multiple strings. Oh yes, I remember now. So find all returns something slightly different depending on if there's more than one group in the regular expression or not. Email, the email regex has no groups, so this is going to just return a, a simple list of strings. But since there are groups here, find all is going to return a list of tuples for each match, and each tuple has several strings in it, one string for each of these groups. And the really simple way to solve that problem is just put everything inside one large group. And that way, Group 0, the very first group, is going to cover the entire matched text. So I'm going to press Control S to save, and let's run this again. So that's good. Now we can just go through this list, and we know that the first string in each of these tuples will be the full phone number. So I'll have to do something like, uh, let me, I'll just create a, a blank list called all phone numbers. Just start off as a blank list. And then I'll just loop over all of the tuples inside this list of tuples in extracted phone. So I'll just say for phone number in extracted phone. So on each iteration through this loop, the phone number variable will be assigned a single tuple from this list of tuples in extracted phone. And I'll just append the, that phone number to all phone numbers. So all phone numbers dot append phone number. Uh, oh, phone number zero. I just want that first string in this tuple. So by the time this loop completes, the all phone numbers list will have all of those first strings from this tuple that was taken from this extracted phone, which was a list of tuples. So basically, on the first iteration of that for loop, phone number will be set phone number will be set to this value, this tuple, and phone number zero will just be this first string. And this will be appended to the all phone numbers list. Let's check this out right now. Instead of extracted phone, I'll just print out this uh, all phone numbers list and we can test that. Uh, we've already tested this, I'll just get rid of that. To go back here, press control C to copy, and then run this program and test it again. Okay, that seems to work just fine. All right, so we have this list value with all the phone numbers and also a list of all the email addresses, but we don't want to copy this text to the clipboard. We don't want all these quotes and commas and everything. It'd be much nicer if we could just have one phone number per line. So just have this phone number on a line and then followed by this phone number on its own line. So we can do that with the join method. Remember, join takes a list of strings, such as our all phone numbers list, and it joins them together into a single string, and this string will be in, be in between each of the strings in this list. So I'll just put a new line character. So there's a new line character in between all of the string, the phone numbers in this list of phone numbers. So that'll put them one phone number per line. And I'll do the same for the email addresses as well. These are just expressions that evaluate to a string value. I need to do something with that string value. So I'll just store it in a variable. I'll just say results equals this string, and then I'll concatenate a new line to that, and then concatenate all of those emails. So this forms one giant string that is stored in the results variable. 
And then I'll just use Piper Clip's uh, copy function to copy that text to the clipboard. All right, let's do a test run of this. Go to this document, this huge 100-page document full of phone numbers and email addresses that would take me hours to copy out by hand. And instead, I'll just press Control A to select all, Control C to copy this to the clipboard, and then just run my program. And there, it has no output whatsoever. There's no print function calls here. But if this has worked correctly, all of those phone numbers and email addresses have been extracted, put into a nicer format, and then that text has been copied to the clipboard. So I could go to a word processor program and open up a new document and just paste all of that data to this document. It's a much nicer format. Or if I wanted to email this to somebody, I could just paste it into the email, or I could paste it into a spreadsheet program. It's in a format that works a lot nicer. If I wanted it in a slightly different format, then I could just change this code right here to maybe have, I don't know, commas in between instead of new lines. But basically whatever I wanted. And since I have this in its own program, even if I had multiple documents like this, I could just open up the next document, press Control A, press Control C to copy, and then run the program again for that. And then just take that data that's now on the clipboard and also paste it to the document as well. And so that's how writing a very small Python program, this is just, what, about 30 lines long, just having some programming knowledge can save you hours of time on boring tasks. Welcome to Lesson 29. In this lesson, we're going to create a program using all of our regular expression and previous programming knowledge. So say that your boss comes to you with a giant PDF file full of phone numbers and email addresses and says, I need you to copy and paste out every single phone number in this document. And this document is dozens of pages long. So if you had to do this on your own, just copying and pasting each of these lines over and over and over again, this would take you hours, especially if you had multiple documents like this. Instead, let's write a Python program that will do this for us. Now, it'll be a lot easier if we can just go to these documents, press Control A to select all, and then Control C to copy it and then have our program just read this text off of the clipboard. So we'll be using the Piper Clip module for this program. So in a brand new editor window, let's just save this as phone and email.py. Since this will be a program that we run over and over again, we're going to start it off with a shebang line, which tells Python which version of Python that we want to run this script. So I'm on Windows, so for me it'll look like Python 3. And next, let's create a series of to-do comments that will just sort of create a skeleton of what we want our program to do. So first we'll have to create a regex object for phone numbers. Then we'll have to create a regex object for email addresses. And next, we'll have to get the text off the clipboard. And then we'll have to extract the email addresses and phone numbers uh, from this text. And then we'll have to copy the extracted phone numbers and emails to the clipboard. So let's do this one at a time. So at the very top of our program, underneath the shebang line, we're going to have to figure out which modules we want to import. So since we'll be dealing with regular expressions, we'll have to import the RE module. And also since we'll be copying and, uh, and pasting text from the clipboard, we'll have to import the Piper Clip module as well. Now this Piper Clip module doesn't come with Python, so you'll have to install it separately. And there are instructions on doing this in the course notes. You'll just have to use the pip program to install it. So the regular expression objects are created by calling re.compile, and then we just pass it a string. It's usually a lot helpful to use a raw string because we have a lot of backslashes in these strings usually. And I want to use verbose mode for this, so I'm going to pass re verbose as the second argument. So this will allow me to use a triple quoted multi-line string, and also all this white space and even the comments that I add inside of 
the regular expression string won't be a part of the actual pattern that it needs to match. And this will make it a lot more readable. So let me think about the types of phone numbers that I want to uh, be able to collect. So the really basic type is just a three digit area code with the phone number separated by dashes, but that's not the only way that it could look. In fact, the area code could be completely optional and not even there, or the area code could be surrounded by parentheses, and instead of that first dash, just have a space instead. And then we could also have phone numbers that have extensions after them. So it could look like the word EXT followed by a number of digits. Let's say this will be anywhere between two and five digits long for the extension. Or that could look like ext dot, or even just the letter x. So let me just write out some more comments inside this regular expression string. This will sort of be the skeleton of all the different parts of the regular expression I want to make. So we'll have this area code, which is optional. And then we'll have that first separator that comes after the area code. And we'll have the first three digits followed by another separator, followed by the last four digits, and then followed by an extension, which will also be optional. Let me just add some spaces here by highlighting them all and adding tabs. Okay, so the area code this is pretty simple. Could just be three digits, or it could be the parentheses, the three digits surrounded by parentheses. So I'm going to put this in a group. These parentheses will create this as its own separate group. So I'll say I'm looking for this group or, which I use the vertical pipe character to mean or, or I'm looking for another group and this one has literal parentheses, so I'm going to have to escape them with the backslash. So an opening parenthesis followed by three digits, followed by a literal closing parenthesis. And also this entire area code could be optional, so I'm going to put it in its own group. And this group means you know, either this pattern or this pattern, and that group itself will be optional. I'll put the question mark right here that says this entire group can appear in the pattern zero or one times. And after that, we'll just have the separator. Could either be a white space character like the space, so I'll just use the space uh, shorthand character class, or it could be a dash. I'll just put this in its own group as well. And next we'll have the first three digits. This is pretty simple. We'll just have three digit characters that we're looking for, followed by another separator. We'll just say that this will be the dash in between the first three and last four characters, or uh, digits. We'll have the last four digits that we're looking for. And then we'll have an extension. Uh, so this is going to be a little complicated. Let's think. Could it either be the word ext followed optionally by a literal parenthesis. So I'm sorry, a literal period. So let's put that literal period that's been escaped with the backslash inside its own group and then put a question mark after that saying that this is optional. It could appear or it could not appear. And then we'll have a space character that follows it followed by a certain number of digits. So we'll say, so we'll have a certain number of digits here. We put this in its own group. We'll say it could be two to five digits. So we'll use that curly brace, meaning that this pattern here for a single digit could appear two to five times. And of course, let's put all, all of this extension stuff. Oh, whoops, almost forgot about this format. So let's put all of this inside of a group so the extension could look like that. We're actually going to keep, I'm going to just separate this part out. The extension could look like this with ext followed optionally by a parenthesis, or followed optionally by a period, and then a space. Or it could just look like the letter x by itself. So I'll just put this as that word part of the extension. I'll just say extension word part, and I'll just cut and paste this on the next line. This will be the extension, the number part, and it's also optional. And I'll need to put both of these parts 
inside of a group and make that group optional. So I'm going to have a opening parenthesis here, and then a close parenthesis here, and follow it up with a question mark so that this entire group will be optional. So this looks pretty complicated, right? But verbose mode allows us to add these comments and also these new lines and other space characters as part of the regular expression string without changing what the pattern is. So if we didn't have verbose mode, we'd have to use a single line string that would look like this. So this line of code is much harder to read and make sense of than this line of code. At least we have the comments here telling us what each of these parts are. So if we have to go back in and make changes to this code later, it'll be a lot easier to figure out what we meant by all of this code than if we just had this giant wall of text right here. So now that I'm done with this part uh, of creating a regular expression for phone numbers, I'll get rid of this to do. And I'll just leave this comment here. This will describe what this part of the code is doing. And of course, compile will return a regular expression object, so we'll have to save that to a variable. Let's just say phone regex. Next, let's move on to create a regular expression for email addresses. So I'll just have something like phone regex equals re compile, have a multi line string, and use verbose mode for this compile function. So the actual regular expression for email addresses is really crazy because email addresses can have all sorts of things. We're used to seeing them as something at something.com, but this name part can also have periods in it, can have plus signs in it. I think it can even have percent and question marks in it, but let's just, um, we'll just handle just dots and plus signs. And we'll also have underscores as well. Those show up in email addresses too. This could be something like .edu or .gov or .net. And this domain name right here could also be using tons of weird characters in it. So we'll just use sort of the same pattern for this as we do for this. So let's just use comments to create a skeleton. First there'll be the name part. Then there'll be the at symbol, followed by the domain name part. So for the name part, we can't just use slash w, because we also need to include characters like this dot and the plus sign. And slash w is a character class just for letters, numbers, and the underscore. So instead, we'll have to create our own character class using the square brackets. So this character class will be able to match uh, lowercase letters and also uppercase letters and the digits 0 through 9. We also want it to match a underscore or a period character or a plus character. Remember, inside of a character class, in between these square brackets, we don't have to escape these dots and plus signs with backslashes. That's only something that we have to do outside of the square brackets in a character class, like what we did here with the parentheses, the literal parentheses that we wanted to match in the pattern. This is the range of characters that can be in this name part of the email address, and we'll be searching for one or more of them, so I'll put a plus sign after that. Next is the at symbol part. This is really easy. We'll say at symbol. And then the domain name part. We'll just go ahead and copy and paste this part and use that. Let's uh, get the text off of the clipboard. So here we can use the Piper Clips, uh, Piper Clip Modules paste function. And that will return the string of the text that's currently on the clipboard. So let's just save that into text. Next, we'll extract the email and phone numbers off of the, uh, the text. So here we'll use this phone regex object. It has a find all method. And we'll just pass it that text to, to check for uh, this phone regular expression pattern. And find all will return a list of strings for us with each string being a matched phone number. So I'll just save that in extracted phone as a variable. And we'll do the same thing for all the email addresses as well. We'll just use the email regular expression object here, and save that in, an, in a variable named extracted email. So we've added a lot of code, but we're not really sure if all of this works or not. 
So let's just temporarily add some print function calls and just print out what the values are inside these two variables. So I'm going to go and instead of selecting all with control A, I'm just going to grab some of the text here. Let's just say, let's just highlight just this amount and press control C to copy that to the clipboard. And then I'll run this program. So the extracted email seems to work. This is just a list of email address strings. That's exactly what we expected. But this it looks a little strange. It's not a list of strings, but actually a list of tuples. And inside the tuples, there are multiple strings. Oh yes, I remember now. So find all returns something slightly different depending on if there's more than one group in the regular expression or not. Email, the email regex has no groups, so this is going to just return a, a simple list of strings. But since there are groups here, find all is going to return a list of tuples for each match, and each tuple has several strings in it, one string for each of these groups. And the really simple way to solve that problem is just put everything inside one large group. And that way, group 0, the very first group, is going to cover the entire matched text. So I'm going to press Control S to save, and let's run this again. So that's good. Now we can just go through this list, and we know that the first string in each of these tuples will be the full phone number. So I'll have to do something like, uh, let me, I'll just create a, a blank list called all phone numbers. Just start off as a blank list. And then I'll just loop over all of the tuples inside this list of tuples in extracted phone. So I'll just say for phone number in extracted phone. So on each iteration through this loop, the phone number variable will be assigned a single tuple from this list of tuples in extracted phone. And I'll just append the, that phone number to all phone numbers. So all phone numbers dot append phone number. Uh, oh, phone number zero. I just want that first string in this tuple. So by the time this loop completes, the all phone numbers list will have all of those first strings from this tuple that was taken from this extracted phone, which was a list of tuples. So basically, on the first iteration of that for loop, phone number will be set. Phone number will be set to this value, this tuple, and phone number zero will just be this first string. And this will be appended to the all phone numbers list. Let's check this out right now. Instead of extracted phone, I'll just print out this uh, all phone numbers list, and we can test that. Uh, we've already tested this. I'll just get rid of that. Have to go back here, press Control C to copy and then run this program and test it again. Okay, that seems to work just fine. All right, so we have this list value with all the phone numbers and also a list of all the email addresses, but we don't want to copy this text to the clipboard. We don't want all these quotes and commas and everything. It'd be much nicer if we could just have one phone number per line. So you just have this phone number on a line and then followed by this phone number on its own line. So we can do that with the join method. Remember, join takes a list of strings, such as our all phone numbers list, and it joins them together into a single string, and this string will be in, be in between each of the strings in this list. So I'll just put a new line character. So there's a new line character in between all of the string, the phone numbers in this list of phone numbers. So that'll put them one phone number per line. And I'll do the same for the email addresses as well. These are just expressions that evaluate to a string value. I need to do something with that string value. So I'll just store it in a variable. I'll just say results equals this string, and then I'll concatenate a new line to that, and then concatenate all of those emails. So this forms one giant string that is stored in the results variable. And then I'll just use Piperclip's uh, copy function copy that text to the clipboard. All right, let's do a test run of this. Go to this document, this huge 100-page document full of phone numbers and email addresses that would take me hours to copy out by hand. 
and instead I'll just press Ctrl A to select all, Ctrl C to copy this to the clipboard, and then just run my program. And there, it has no output whatsoever, there's no print function calls here, but if this has worked correctly, all of those phone numbers and email addresses have been extracted, put into a nicer format, and then that text has been copied to the clipboard. So I could go to a word processor program and open up a new document and just paste all of that data to this document. It's a much nicer format. Or if I wanted to email this to somebody, I could just paste it into the email, or I could paste it into a spreadsheet program. It's in a format that works a lot nicer. If I wanted it in a slightly different format, then I could just change this code right here to maybe have, I don't know, commas in between instead of new lines. But basically whatever I wanted. And since I have this in its own program, even if I had multiple documents like this, I could just open up an, the next document, press Ctrl A, press Ctrl C to copy, and then run the program again for that. And then just take that data that's now on the clipboard and also paste it to the document as well. And so that's how writing a very small Python program, this is just, what, about 30 lines long, just having some programming knowledge can save you hours of time on boring tasks.